and thanks for your nice introduction. And also, I would like to thank Yang Su for inviting me to give a talk in this workshop. So, <clears throat> yeah, today actually we'll talk about uh, uh, bio, or what, our recent uh, development uh, in the synthetic biology. So uh, I think for this audience, of course, I don't need to you know, uh, tell you what synthetic biology is, right? The field really started about uh, 20 years ago. And uh, I think uh, if here I just defined it as uh, uh, the design or, you know, a design of improved or novel biological system using engineering principles. And those principles that you know, you're all kind of applying already. But I think particularly it's the design view test loop, right? That's kind of the hallmark for the data biology. So the field, uh, as I said, really started uh, you know, um, 20 years ago, which is marked by the nature paper that described uh, the design of a toggle switch for gene regulation. But after 20 years uh, of development, Clearly, we now enter a new phase, and this new phase, I think, is defined by you know, the incorporation of uh, uh, new tools like uh, laboratory automation, foundry uh, that we are interested in, and also AI, you know, as uh, Sanyapati already mentioned. Right? So I will actually today show you how we can really combine AI, um, synthetic biology, and laboratory automation to achieve uh, autonomous experimentation you know, uh, as our ultimate goal for biology applications. So my group has really worked at the interface of now these three kind of areas. And uh, our goal, of course, is to integrate them, right? to uh, uh, use them for you know, next generation synthetic biology applications. So we're very interested in de 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 uh, developing uh, new uh, very large tools, and in the form of a biofoundry, but we're also interested in developing AI machine learning tools for enzyme function prediction and enzyme engineering. But we can also extend you know, AI tools for metabolic engineering, pathogen engineering, or even other you know, type of research as well. And then we also are very interested in developing enzyme engineering tools, uh, metabolic engineering tools, and you know, as I have already kind of highlighted all the major milestones you know, in the metabolic engineering field. And then we try to leverage this uh, you know, a technology platform for three main applications. Uh, one application is related to natural quality discovery and development, which I actually will talk about uh, today, how we actually can leverage the biofoundry to discover you know, uh, novel natural products with more activities. And also there's an opportunity to incorporate the AI to, to discover new bioactive uh, compounds very quickly. And then the second major application it is for metabolic engineering. And of course, you know, we are all developing various tools for you know, metabolic engineering for production of all kinds of uh, products. But I would say that uh, this field is also ready for development of uh, new AI tools as well. And then lastly, we're also interested in developing uh, you know, synthetic biology tools for mammalian synthetic biology, which is probably different from what you guys are working on. But I think that's also, you know, a lot of opportunities, right? We can <clears throat> develop, uh, you know, those CRISPR-based tools or other genome editing tools for uh, various organisms and also for treatment of genetic disease or, you know, uh, fundamental studies. So today, actually, I just highlight uh, three kind of uh, short stories. Um, one is actually how actually we can create not function enzymes with novel functions. As we all know, enzymes are the molecular machines, right? You know, we can, in synthetic biology, the enzymes are really is the, the key component, right? In many cases, we just couldn't find the enzyme with the proper function, right? So in many cases, uh, we have to use uh, bioinformatics tools, or you know, in many cases, we probably have to use the enzyme engineering tools to create the enzyme with designer function, but still, you know, creating uh, new functions actually is very challenging and how actually we can solve that problem. And the second uh, uh, problem, or actually also it's kind of fundamental challenge as well, is how can we discover new bioactive natural products more efficiently, right? Because there are so many natural products out there and they clearly can be used as a, a, a major source of uh, drugs and antibiotics, but it's hard to actually discover truly uh, new uh, bioactive compounds. 
And then lastly, and there's something that we all have in mind, is that how can we actually really integrate the synthetic knowledge with the AI, machine learning, and biofoundry for next generation synthetic biology applications? And uh, this, of course, is a big trend, and many people now work uh, along this trend. And I will just show you some kind of our early efforts in, in, in achieving that goal. So then for the first story, how actually we can create uh, you know, enzymes with new function? And of course, we can always use the rational design or you know, direct evolution. But as we all know, um, it is very hard, right? No matter which method you use. When you use the uh, rational design, typically you can create an enzyme with uh, some activities or some functions, but usually not good enough, right? And then you have to use the uh, you know, direct evolution tools to further improve them. And then if you just use direct evolution alone, then it's also very challenging, you know, because the, the creation of a new function may require you know, many simultaneous mutations. And then even with the most powerful selection or screening method, you cannot find the combination of those uh, simultaneous mutations, which if, if it's more than three, right? So th that actually is uh, the challenge. And then actually uh, almost 20 years ago, we came up with uh, 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 a solution basically is to co-evolve the protein with the substrate. Uh, so basically we try to use some intermediate function that can bridge the wild type function and the novel protein function. And we use the right evolution to actually optimize those intermediate functions so that uh, we can reach you know, uh, to create uh, novel functions. So in that uh, study, we used the ligand bind domain of estrogen receptor, you know, and we tried to create a new uh, subspecificity because the wild type of protein can bind estradiol very well, actually with like a nanomolar uh, affinity, but it cannot uh, bind the, the corticosterone that differs from the estradiol by many places, right? It has the overall scaffold, but clearly they're very different so that the corticosterone is considered as a novel substrate. And then we actually selected the two kind of intermediate compound that differ from the previous one, just you know, by a few like uh, uh, modifications. And then we actually use the direct evolution to create the uh, uh, mutant that actually will bind those uh, uh, intermediate uh, uh, compounds. And in the end, after many rounds of direct evolution, we actually created a mutant with uh, that showed a corticosterone activity. So, and this strategy actually was used by researchers from Codexis and uh, Merck to engineer uh, transaminase with a novel substrate specificity. And then that enzyme was used in the synthesis of this drug called the Genuvia, right? So that was the kind of uh, uh, commercial success of this uh, uh, approach, uh, and uh, and of course the Merck had uh, actually just visited there uh, a month ago, so they actually now use this approach to engineer many you know enzymes that they are working on. You know clearly it's an effective approach, but as you can see, this is still very time consuming, and also the choice of the intermediate functions kind of uh, arbitrary, right? So then in the past actually. I would say 15 years, we have been thinking, how can we really create uh, enzymes with uh, new reactivity very quickly? As if you look, look at the, the chemical catalyst, right? They can catalyze many, many reactions. While for enzymes, you know, they are, uh, the reactions that they can catalyze still very limited. Many reactions actually, chemical reactions that cannot be reproduced or can be uh, uh, performed by enzymes. So, and the reason we actually use the enzymes as a catalyst because uh, you know they showed a very high selectivity, right? And that's the main reason why we use it. And then also, it, it, uh, enzymes work under mild conditions, and then it can minimize the use of energy, right? That's also and also environmental friendly. And uh, uh, the chemical catalyst creates a more versatile. And so we were thinking, uh, actually, how can we actually you know make the enzyme more versatile? meaning that they can catalyze some reactions uh, that uh, uh, natural enzyme cannot catalyze. So then we actually, uh, a few years ago, we thought that we could actually incorporate uh, you know, photocatalysis because uh, you know, the uh, photocatalysis involve free radicals and they are very reactive. 
So they can almost uh, react with uh, uh, any like a functional groups. But the problem is that you know, they are not very selective, right? So, so that's the problem. Then we were thinking, is it possible to combine the best of uh, uh, enzyme catalysis uh, and the best of uh, uh, the best of two worlds, basically two types of catalysis, right? To create uh, artificial photoenzymes that can catalyze uh, the reaction that cannot be catalyzed by natural occurring enzymes, and uh, yet it will have the high selectivity. So that's actually is kind of a simple idea, and I think that is possible as, as we summarized in a recent uh, you know, review article. So basically, we can use the light to uh, in uh, create the free radicals in those uh, cofactor dependent uh, enzymes like uh, NAD dependent enzymes or you know, uh, flavor dependent enzymes. So we can generate the radical, then use the active site, which is the chiral environment, kind of to control the reaction to actually achieve a high NNTL selectivity. So in the past few years, actually, we actually kind of uh, demonstrated this concept uh, uh, in a few case studies. So the first uh, case study actually is that we actually used uh, uh, light to create uh, a radical in the FAD uh, in, of the in reductase. And then we can actually uh, catalyze this uh, intermolecular uh, radical hydroalkylation uh, reaction in a highly in NTL selective manner. So the two substrate, the one is the uh, halogenated carbonyl group, uh, uh, Halogenated carbonyl compound, and then the other one is olefin uh, uh, compound, right? So we just use the light to create the radical, and then also the light actually will create the uh, uh, the radical on the one of the substrate as well. And then the substrate actually uh, the carbonyl substrate will react with the olefin to uh, form a prochiral compound, and then the uh, enzyme environment. Uh, actually, the current environment will control the uh, transfer of the hydrogen atom to that the prochiral compound in a defined manner that will lead to the creation of the you know uh, enantial pure compound. And then we also actually tried other you know uh, substrate as well. And we also showed that work. But more recently, we also showed that uh, uh, in addition to you know, creating like a CC bond formation reaction, we can also achieve a, a CN bond formation, right? You know, that is the uh, hydroamination reaction. Uh, here I can show you, you know, a one recent example. So the enzyme we use, as I mentioned, is the inclinatases. So they actually uh, can tolerate a high concentration for organic solvent and also uh, elevated temperature. And also it can have a high enantial activity. And for the uh, hydroamination reaction, there are some you know, uh, chemical uh, approaches already. You know, the, uh, the also involve uh, uh, radical uh, chemistry as well. So the first uh, actually example was published more than hundred years ago, right? And, and then uh, more recently, you know, they also uh, published by several groups. And uh, the products, you know, all those reactions are all racemic, so now that they're pure, right? So then we will wonder, is it possible actually we can create an artificial enzyme right, that can catalyze this uh, hydroamination reaction in an enantial selective uh, manner. So this uh, reaction is kind of similar to the previous reaction I just mentioned, the CC bond formation reaction. So basically we use now a nitrogen containing compound with the leaving group. So under the light, it will actually form the nitrogen radical, right? And then we also introduce the light to introduce the radical on the FAD. So now the, um, the nitrogen radical will react with the olefin compound to form, to form a prochiral compound. And then once again, the hydrogen atom transfer step between the FAD and the prochiral compound will be controlled by the active site of the enzyme, right? And then it will achieve the enantial, you know, high enantial selectivity. So we actually screened the many, you know, those uh, natural occurring in reductases and found that some of them already can catalyze that reaction in uh, good, uh, you know, enantial selectivity, like 80, 80%, but that's still not good enough 
So then we actually performed the direct evolution to further improve the inland tail selectivity. So essentially, we just select you know, those active site residues that interact with the substrate, and then we will uh, mutate them to a few like residues. And then we created those mutants and use HPLC to analyze them one by one. But we found some mutations indeed can improve the inland tail selectivity. Then we can repeat this cycle in you know, a few runs. And we attended uh, you know, those uh, triple mutants that showed uh, uh, almost like 98 or 97% EE to certain you know, uh, compounds. And of course, we tried many you know, compounds just show the uh, substrate scope. And then we also uh, tried the autofen substrate as well. So basically, you know, the enzymes we created not just work for one you know, substrate, right? it can work on uh, you know, several related substrate. So that will make uh, the catalyst you know, useful, right, for uh, the synthesis of uh, you know, chiral compounds. And I should point out that why we're interested in the hydroamination reactions, because uh, many drugs actually contain nitrogen. Right? So the uh, amination reaction is a very important uh, uh, reaction in uh, drug synthesis. And this, of course, is just the beginning. You know, as we summarized in our uh, review article, you know, there are many ways actually to combine photocatalysis with uh, enzyme catalysis to create uh, you know, those uh, photobiocatalysis. And uh, you can engineer the natural occurring photo enzymes, or just like we did, we can create the artificial photo enzymes by uh, creating the radicals in the cofactors. But uh, I should point out that there are many cofactors that we can explore, not just the, the uh, NAD or FAM. They are also like a uh, heme or cobalamine or like a uh, PLP, right? There are many enzymes, as we know, use cofactors. So in principle, we can always create the radical, you know, on those cofactors. And then we can also explore, you know, the enzyme scaffold, right, to catalyze many different reactions. So mm -hmm. that's why I think I'm very excited about this uh, interaction because there are so many, you know, reactions that we can. Uh, explore, you know, by this uh, simple strategy. Okay, now I try to switch your gear a little bit. I want to talk about the second story, how we can actually leverage the biofoundry for discovery of uh, novel bioactive natural products. And the reason we are interested in natural products is because, uh, you know, they are a major source of drugs, right? But the discovery of uh, new natural products is uh, clearly uh, diminishing. And if we look at the, the antibiotics we use nowadays, most of them were discovered in the 50s and 60s. So currently there are very few natural, uh, antibiotics that have been approved by FDA. And this clearly is a problem because we know microorganisms will develop a resistance very quickly, right? And also if you look at the, the drugs that have been approved by FDA between 1981 and 2007, uh, the red line represents natural product-based drugs. The black line represents uh, the uh, natural product-derived drugs. So if you add these two you know, lines together, basically you, uh, natural products-based or derived uh, uh, compounds represent a major fraction of the, the FDA-approved drugs. The problem is the same. You know, there are fewer and fewer of those uh, small molecular drugs that have been approved. Uh, by FDA in the past uh, like, uh, years. Uh, and then actually, thanks to the advances you know, in genomics, nowadays we actually discover those uh, natural power biosynthetic or biosynthetic gene clusters very quickly, like using the anti-smash tool uh, uh, sample just mentioned. And uh, most of them actually have not been characterized. And uh, one problem is that the you know, majority of those uh, Authentic gene clusters actually are silent or you know cryptic, you know, under the laboratory condition, right? So basically, they cannot produce the natural products, um, and that's why we couldn't discover you know uh, many uh, new natural products. So in the past, uh, I would say almost twenty years, you know, we tried to actually develop a, a high throughput pipeline for discovery of no novel natural products. Uh, we want, of course want to use bioinformatics tools you know, to. Uh, um, to uh, identify those biosynthetic gene clusters, right? And then also prioritize them. And then we use the biofoundry, basically try to build, you know, those clusters, uh, either by refactoring or, you know, 
directly cloning, right? Direct cloning of those uh, clusters from the native host. And then of course, we want to also use the high throughput uh, uh, method to detect the product, right? And if the products can be detected, then we want to um, do the bioassays as well for the structural characterization. So here, I just want to use the uh, RIPS you know, as an example. You know, RIPS stands for ribosomally synthesized uh, post-translation and modified peptides. So they are basically uh, uh, peptides, right? Uh, synthesized just like uh, proteins by ribosomes. And they all actually follow the same biosynthetic uh, mechanism as the peptides that consist of uh, uh, core peptides and leader peptides. And then the core peptides actually will be modified by the tannin enzymes in the biosynthetic gene cluster. And then the uh, leader peptide actually will be cleaved by the protease either in the cluster or somewhere in the chromosome. And then the product will be released from the cell. So here I show some examples. So if you look at those examples, you may not recognize them as uh, um, peptides, right? Because they are heavily modified. But some of them you can see, they still have the amino acid, right? So that's why you know. And the most famous um, uh, RIPS compound actually is the nicin that has been used as a food preservative for more than 70 years. And also there are some you know, uh, RIPS-based uh, antibiotics and anti-cancer compounds as well at least under you know, clinical trials. So then recently, we actually developed a uh, high throughput pipeline to discover you know, uh, novel uh, RIPS compounds. So basically, we actually um, use the bioinformatics tools to discover those uh, uh, uncharacterized uh, RIP biointerjection clusters. And then we actually asked the tw twist about science to synthesize those uh, genes right, in those uh, clusters. And then we use the biofoundry to build those biosynthetic gene clusters in a high throughput manner. And those clusters range from two genes to nine genes, right? And compared to uh, other clusters of natural parts, RIPS biosynthetic gene clusters are relatively really short, actually. Uh, typically, it's less than 15 kb not, not. And then, so we can easily you know, refactor them. And then we actually uh, transform the um, Plasmid containing the biosynthetic gene clusters into E. coli for heterosis expression. And then we also use the high throughput uh, LC spec to detect the product. So we found that the refactoring strategy works pretty well. Almost like 90% of the clusters could be correctly refactored. And the ones that have problems is the one with like nine genes or eight genes, right? So for the, uh, if the cluster is less than five genes, then the assembly efficiency is almost like 100%. But once it becomes bigger, it's harder. So that clearly there's a room for further improvement in optimizing the cluster, uh, optimizing the uh, uh, assembly. And then out of the uh, 28 out of the uh, 83 correctly assembled uh, clusters, we found uh, uh, they can produce like a new peaks by LCMS spec, right? And then out of this uh, 28, we found that uh, three of them actually can show some uh, activities. And particularly, uh, one of them showed the uh, activity towards uh, the Clavashella pneumonia, uh, which is uh, one of the escape pathogens, is a gram negative, right? As you know that there are a lot of antibiotics, but there are very few antibiotics that works for gram negative for pathogens. And now we actually find the, the first plenty uh, peptide that have this uh, activity. And we also determine the chemical structure. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a cyclic peptide, heavily modified, right? And but this approach, as you can see, it works very well for relatively short biosynthetic clusters because we can uh, refactor them you know, in a very uh, efficient manner. And then, uh, um, and also we can discover uh, active compound. But the problem is that the success rate is still kind of low, right? So out of the eight, you know, 83 clusters, we only find that three of them show the bioactivity, you know, at least the antimicrobial activity. We don't know whether they have uh, activity towards other you know, uh, um, organism or, or not, we don't know. So then actually recently, uh, we actually also developed another complementary strategy and that actually can work well for those large biosynthetic clusters. Uh, as I mentioned, many biosynthetic clusters actually are 
more than 50 kb long or even 100 kb long, right? So we actually developed the, this uh, direct cloning method uh, called the uh, capture method. So we basically use the uh, Cas12a, you know, to um, cut the genomic DNA that uh, encode the target about synthetic gene cluster, and then actually like it that the genomic DNA fragment, which is very long, with uh, two uh, receiver DNA that contain the original replication and also the selection marker, right? And also the box P side. And then we actually use the Cree recombinase to ligate to those three pieces DNA together to form the large passages that contain the, uh, the target of BGC. So if you just use the T4 DNA ligase, it will not work you know, for those large uh, clusters. But the Cree locks P system works very efficiently. So then we find that the, the, the method actually works uh, uh, highly efficient, you know, up to like almost 90% or 100%. So when you clone the cluster, you, you, yeah, with almost like 100% efficiency. So in that paper, we showed that we cloned more than 48, you know, those biosynthetic clusters, ranging from 20 kb to 100 kb, right, with high efficiency. And we also discovered more than six, you know, novel compounds. But then recently, we actually want to use the biofoundry, right, to really, uh, you know, um, accelerate that uh, uh, process. Because the if you clone one cluster, it's relatively easy. But if you want to clone hundreds or thousands of them, then it's also time consuming, right? So then we actually, you know, develop the, an automated workflow for direct cloning. Essentially, we use uh, uh, the biofoundry to do the PCR reaction, you know, to amplify all those uh, receiver DNAs, right? There are many uh, of them. And then also we actually did all the digestion and do the transformation. And particularly is the E. coli surmises uh, conjugation, right? That is also time consuming step. So we actually now can uh, perform all these steps in a fully automated manner. And uh, we selected uh, more than 100 you know, biosynthetic clusters as a test case, right? To, and we showed that uh, the efficiency is very high. We can clone them, you know, uh, even up to 100 KB, right? Uh, those uh, clusters with 84% uh, um, uh, you know, efficiency. For the uh, shorter ones, like 50%, 50 KB, we can achieve almost 100%, right? So basically we can clone those uh, clusters from the native producers you know, very quickly. And these uh, 100 uh, clusters actually covers uh, different uh, classes of natural products, right? Not just ribs. As I mentioned, ribs are very, very short, right? There are not many long ribs, but they are PKS, uh, NRPS, or terpenes, right? They actually are involve very large clusters. So here we actually uh, just use 11, you know, stromyces uh, strands to uh, identify you know, more than 100 of those uncharacterized uh, biosynthetic clusters. And they all contain self-resistant genes. And that is a, a trick that we use to identify uh, our active compounds more efficiently. You know? Because the, the self-resistant gene is kind of a hallmark for the activity of the natural products, right? And that strategy has, has been used by quite a few groups to discover you know, our active uh, compounds. And indeed, we actually, uh, when we counted those uh, 100 uh, clusters using the robotic system, we found that uh, uh, 23 uh, 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 of them can produce uh, uh, new peaks. And uh, um, uh, uh, 12 of them, 12 out of 100 of those BGCs produce new peaks, right? The 23 peaks, because some clusters produce more than one, right? And uh, uh, indeed, you know, for some customers, we isolated the four compounds. And uh, uh, it could be intermediates or could be the final compounds, right? And then uh, we actually select the 11 of them that can be produced at a high amount. Then we actually purify, the, uh, purify them for further structural determination. That's why we know the structures, right, as shown here. And uh, uh, some polyketides, some actually the other ribs, you know, compounds. And then we did the bioassay, and indeed, you know, at least the one compound from each cluster actually showed bioactivity. And some of them also are already known. You know, it's not like uh, although the cluster has not been characterized before, but they are known compounds because they were produced by some organisms uh, and they already been characterized before. But we just don't know they are biosynthetic cluster. 
So I think this actually is a, a very encouraging and that shows that now we can um, I, uh, basically um, identify those biosynthetic clusters that produce the bioactive compounds you know, very efficiently. And okay, now in the remaining time, I want to show you actually how we can now incorporate uh, AI and uh, laboratory automation um, into synthetic biology. Right? So, and I want to argue that um, this is a really you know exciting direction, right? And if you look at the, the pipeline for synthetic biology, right? uh, almost every step could be impacted by AI. Right. And I think uh, Sanyapati already made uh, that uh, comment, right? So basically you can use uh, AI machine learning tools to design you know, uh, uh, DNA or promoters like terminators, right? Or proteins or pathways or even the whole organisms. But also you can use AI tools uh, to predict uh, the functions you know, of uh, the promoters, terminators, the proteins, uh, enzymes, right? Not just for the design part, also the prediction part, but also the even the design of the whole system, and uh, and also laboratory automation, you know, could be impacted or could be used for many steps in this whole pipeline as well. So a few years ago, actually, we wrote a review article that summarized all the AI tools that have been used for biological research, right? and also showed many you know, examples. So clearly, this is a, a very rapidly growing area. And then last year, Nathan and I actually organized a, a DOE workshop right, that is focused on uh, you know, the development uh, and application of AI machine learning for uh, synthetic biology applications. And uh, the report just published you know, earlier this year. So if you're into this direction, then definitely suggest you to read it. And then also you know, for the essay synthetic biology, we actually started the initiative you know, several months ago. And now it's because it's already closed, but we will continue to actually uh, push uh, uh, this direction in the journal. We want to get more and more you know, uh, papers you know, uh, in this uh, area. And then recently, you know, uh, not recently, actually three years ago, I was also very fortunate to get a grant from MSF to set up an institute called the Molecular Maker Lab Institute, which is one of the uh, first seven AI institutes funded by NSF. And this institute actually is really focused on the development of a new AI machine learning tools and a new chemistry or biochemistry to accelerate and democratize uh, molecular synthesis and uh, functional material discovery. Uh, so right now there are 24 AI institutes in the United States, but this is the only one right now is focused on chemistry or molecular synthesis. All the other ones focus on education, learning, physics, biology, right? Or, or, or you know, the, the, uh, just AI itself. So, so in this institute, we have uh, uh, 20 PIs from, you know, um, half of them from uh, CS department have from chemistry and the chemical engineering. So we are working on like five thrusts. The, the, the first two thrusts really focus on the development of AI tools for synthesis planning and a catalyst uh, uh, optimization and selection. And then in thrust three, we actually have uh, three target molecules. Two of them are drugs. Uh, one is actually, is, uh, uh, the third one is a uh, molecule used in polymer processing. So we try to use them as a test case, right? for the AI tools that we develop. And then in thrust four, we are focusing on organic photovoltaic material. So we try to discover you know, new organic photovoltaic material with increased efficiency and stability. But we try to really leverage the biofoundry, right? And also a, a chemical foundry that we actually uh, develop, right? So for chemical synthesis. And then we basically want to develop those uh, AI tools for you know molecular synthesis, and so currently we have uh, twenty PIs involved. You know many students and postdocs, and also we have uh, you know eight you know, uh, you know companies involved, uh, including several major pharmaceutical companies like uh, Amgen, Pfizer, Genentech, and also IBM. You know as our uh, key partner uh, to develop you know all those uh, uh, tools. And uh, one key deliverable in the institute is really the alpha synthesis. Uh, platform. This is an AI platform, 
that we try to develop. Right? So basically, we want to use the like a natural language uh, processing tools to mine you know, the literature, right? To get the, uh, the, all the information about the chemical reactions, the enzymatic reactions, all the you know the protein mutants, right? You know, basically the reaction conditions or experimental protocols, right? Basically get all the relevant information for reactions, essentially. And then we also have, you know, leverage the existing database. Um, there are many, you know, database containing enzyme reaction or chemical reactions. And then also we want to generate the data, you know, using our chemical foundry or bio foundry, right? Um, because uh, in the literature or in the existing database, usually they don't have a negative data. So we need to generate those negatives by ourselves. And then we actually you know, use those uh, database to actually develop uh, machine uh, learning tools right, for synthesis planning, catalyst selection and optimization, and as well as the uh, process optimization. Right? Um, so in the past few, uh, three years, we developed the, a number of tools. And you know, today I just uh, highlight uh, actually two of them. And uh, the first one, it's actually kind of mentioned by Sanyabali already. So basically, uh, as we all know, in protein uh, science, there are two fundamental challenges, right? One is the prediction of structure from sequence. And the second one is the prediction of function from structure or sequence. And the first challenge actually was kind of solved by DeepMind, which developed that uh, alpha fold. Now with that tool, you can actually know the structure you know, in a few minutes, right? So that is, uh, truly transformative uh, or revolutionary. And I would argue this is probably still the biggest application of AI in science so far. And then the second two, actually, uh, the, the second challenge, we kind of, we haven't solved that problem yet completely, but we actually developed the uh, uh, AI to, to predict the enzyme function, right? It's actually is the EC number. Uh, and we are kind of inspired by the DPEC method uh, in a sample uh, we mentioned now already. And um, uh, so in this uh, uh, AI tool, we actually use the contrastive learning uh, kind of architecture that to address the data imbalance issue actually in you know the protein sequences. And we actually did a benchmark with uh, you know, the DPEC and also the protein infer that was developed by Google. Uh, uh, and we showed that the, at least at that time, you know, we outperformed those tools. And then also we actually benchmarked with the BLAST-P, which is the bioinformatics tool that the most people use to predict uh, uh, enzyme functions. And, uh, we also did some experimental validation as well, because so we actually uh, used uh, uh, halogenase uh, as a uh, kind of a test case and uh, showed that we can predict uh, you know, the different the subclasses of halogenase, uh, uh, their functions more accurately than the other you know, bioinformatics or machine learning tools. Uh, particularly, we identified a few enzymes that were misannotated or unlabeled, you know, have not been labeled it is hypothetical, right? And then also some enzymes show that uh, it's a, a single reaction, but we actually predicted to have, have a multiple reaction. Basically the enzyme has like a promiscuous uh, functions. And we actually uh, synthesize those genes and purify the enzyme and then did the detailed enzyme kinetic analysis to prove that uh, you know, the prediction were uh, correct essentially. And then we also made this tool you know, uh, uh, broadly available. So we developed this web interface. So the users just need to enter the sequence in the box. You know. Now, uh, after clicking the uh, button, you will get the uh, predicted uh, um, enzyme function. And also, you can get the uh, structure as well using alpha fold. But this is still the beginning, right? Because this only actually uh, can predict uh, the EC number. Now we also develop tools to predict uh, the specificity, the, the selectivity, particularly, right? That's challenging, and also the solubility, stability. So there are many tools, you know, probably that actually want to know ahead of time while we actually design the biosynthetic pathway, right? And then another tool actually we developed uh, actually is called the ECNet that is used for enzyme engineering. So in that case, in that tool, we actually use the language model actually to analyze all the protein sequences in the unit prop. And then also 
uh, look at all the homologous sequences for the target of protein to identify those evolutionary coupled residues. And then we also made some uh, mutants you know, for the target of protein. So basically we combined uh, these three data sets into a machine learning model, right? Uh, called a long short-term memory model, and then use that uh, architecture to predict the, the mutations that can, um, uh, can improve the protein function. And we also did a you know, benchmark study with other machine learning models for enzyme engineering. So our model is highlighted uh, actually uh, in red, and, and uh, we used the, the 38, you know, the deep mutagenesis scanning data sets that are available to actually uh, test the performance of those uh, uh, machine learning models. And we showed that our model outperformed all the you know, machine learning models at that time. But this field is developing so quickly. So almost every month, you will see another you know, new machine learning model for protein engineering. So it's hard to catch up. But, but, but anyway, at least at that time, it was the best, but now it's not. And then we also, uh, did some experimental validation as well. So we used the beta lactamase as a test case. We tried to find the mutations that can improve the activity of the enzyme towards uh, uh, ampicillin. And uh, we actually did some experimental validation as well using like a high concentration of the antibiotics. And indeed, we showed that the <coughs> engineer, the mutant works better than the wild type um, enzyme. And, uh, Lastly, you know, I'm also actually involved in the DOE Bioenergy Center called the CAVI. Yangsu is also part of it. So one of the key goals in the conversion theme in the center is really to develop a self-driving biofoundry for enzyme engineering and metabolic engineering. So in the previous example, I showed that you know, we developed the, the biofoundry to discover new like, uh, uh, bioactive compounds. But that one's mainly we leverage the high throughput right, of the capability of the biofoundry. And we haven't really incorporated the AI machine learning tools uh, into the biofoundry yet. But if we can combine them, then in principle, we can have you know, the self-driving -bio biofoundry. So we started this effort actually more than seven years ago. And that is also the reason why I moved into AI machine learning area. It's not because you know, I thought that it's a fancy or it's a trendy. For me, I thought it's a necessity. It's because you know, in order to develop the self-driving biofoundry, we have to incorporate the AI, which actually will basically make experimental validations in each round of uh, you know, uh, improvement. And so at that time, we actually used the lycopene like, biosynthesis pathway as an example. You know, it's very simple, only three genes. And uh, we want to optimize the flux through the pathway. And we use uh, 24 promoters with different strengths. And in principle, there will be more than 13,000 combinations, right? And then uh, we can make all of those you know, uh, pathway variants using the biofoundry, but it will be very time consuming and also uh, tedious as well. Uh, expensive, not tedious, expensive. And so we will wonder whether it's possible actually to incorporate AI so that we can reduce the search space, right? And do fewer experiments. And indeed, actually we showed that it's possible. And I think that is still remains the first demonstration of the closed design build test and loop for you know, synthetic biology applications. So we showed that the, um, in the first round, we just randomly pick you know, 46 variants, right? And then analyze the, the product. You know, um, and, and then use the vision optimization algorithm to make predictions on the combination of promoter that can lead to improve the production of the lycopene. And then we actually select, made, uh, made another 46 variants and then repeat this whole cycle again. And then we did the three rounds, right? But all these experiments were done by the robotic system. So basically, the biofoundry design experience, performed experience, analyzed the data all by itself. That's why we call it it's self self driving. And uh, so in total, we actually analyzed, uh, made, and analyzed uh, 138 you know, variants, which is uh, less than one percent of the total combinations of those variants. Right? And that's really demonstrate, uh, you know the self-driving biofoundry can reduce the experimental efforts significantly. 
And now we extended this uh, effort for protein engineering as well. So we actually developed a, a fully automated method for workflow for basically site direct metagenesis in a high, uh, 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 with a high fidelity and accuracy. And then we can also use uh, uh, low number machine learning models actually to predict the combinations of mutation that can lead to improve the production. So this is a uh, different from the previous one. We just only use the Bayesian optimization, right? Here, we also use uh, some low number machine learning models actually to make uh, predictions. And in addition, we also uh, use the zero shot machine learning model to make uh, initial predictions on the mutations that we should introduce. And similarly, we also develop an automated workflow for metabolic engineering as well. So we could use the, you know, the machine learning models to make predictions on the gene targets, right? Uh, overexpression, downregulation, or knockout targets. Then we can use the biofoundry to basically perform genetic engineering, right? And then analyze the uh, mutants and then repeat this cycle, right? So as you all know, in metabolic engineering, it's also very tedious, right? You have to try many, many combinations, try many, many targets, you know, but with uh, this automated workflow, I think the whole process could be greatly simplified. And then all these efforts actually could be really summarized by this uh, simple uh, kind of a diagram that describes this uh, AI-driven autonomous experimentation vision. So we published this uh, article actually early this year to basically describe how actually uh, in the autonomous uh, experimentation could be performed for synthetic biology applications. So essentially, we will use zero shot machine models you know, to make uh, initial predictions, right? Uh, uh, the, the variations that you want to introduce into the biological system, either it's a protein promoter or whole cells, whatever the thing that you want to work on. That's why I mean, imagine eventually we may have like a, a chat GPT, like a, a machine learning model, I call it synthetic biology GPT. Basically it can work for any kind of uh, biological uh, target, right? And then we use the biofoundry basically to you know, make you know, those variants, right? And then we use the low number machine learning model basically to analyze uh, the, the uh, to make predictions on the combinations of those uh, variations that we introduced, right? And then we can repeat the cycle again and again. And I think the power of this approach is really the iteration, right? And as well know uh, for synthetic biology applications. So in summary, what I showed today that you know, we actually come up with a very actually efficient strategy to create uh, enzymes with new to nature reactivities for symmetric synthesis. The photobiocatalysis, I think, is really the platform, right, to generate many, many, you know, enzymes with uh, new to nature reactivities. And then also I showed that we developed a, a biofoundry for synthetic biology applications, and particularly is the application of the biofoundry for discovery of uh, novel uh, bioactive natural products, and also the development of self-driving biofoundry for pathway engineering, and now we extend to enzyme engineering and metabolic engineering. And uh, particularly, I think is I'm excited by the vision of uh, you know, AI-driven autonomous experimentation. And this is really uh, demonstrate uh, a new research paradigm actually for the entire biology. And I call it the you know, entire biology 2.0, right? So it's a way to integrate the entire biology with uh, AI and uh, laboratory automation. So finally, I would like to thank the students who did most of the work. Many of them are graduated already. But I thank the initial funding from Cover Foundation to build the prototype uh, foundry almost 10 years ago. And then also DARPA for the proof of concept study. And then mostly actually our work is funded by DOE, actually the Bioengineering Center to develop the capabilities for the foundry and NSF for the development of AI machine learning tools and NSF, uh, NIH for work related to natural product discovery. So thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy. Thanks, Gerald. Thank you for taking us on a journey through the new era of synthetic biology. Now we have a, a few minutes for question and answer. So if you have a please do it. Yes, uh, if I may, I, I have some question about your work. Uh, in the development of novel enzyme using using light. Yeah. 
they said that you, you urinate your substrate to create a radical and the final enzyme that used that radical as a substrate. Yeah. Did I understand correctly? That's right. But I think uh, once formed, the radical is, is very unstable. So I think that the unpaired electron try, will, will try to find way all yeah. around the molecules. So how um, can you- What we find is actually is very stable. Okay, that's a, I, I think the, the, the enzyme active site provided an environment for, uh, to stabilize the radical. And then the, the radical and the cofactor clearly is stable because uh, it will not move around. It's a covalent bond with the enzyme. And then the substrate, in principle, it can move around because it also has a radical. But we found that the environment, the enzyme active site actually kind of provide the environment. So in all the reactions that we characterized, we didn't see too many side products. Because that was our initial concern as well. Because the, if the substrate, the, especially the the substrate, uh, the radical substrate, right? And it can move around, then it can also well, react maybe, with many. Even try, try to make, make the bond with the enzyme. But that's still possible. It will inactivate the enzyme. That's possible. But we didn't see like a side product, but it is possible still to react with the enzyme. That's why one limitation, actually, I didn't point out, is the, the, the activity is not very high. So we have to use a, a high dose of enzymes in all these reactions. Thank you. But now we're also kind of inspired by Jay's work, recent uh, work, <coughs> try to incorporate the, 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 the novel enzyme into a pathway and uh, uh, do it inside a cell, right? right? So we also want to actually kind of incorporate this uh, photoactive enzyme in the pathway, and then we'll use fermentation to produce product. So that way, you basically can regenerate the enzyme again and again, right? So that can solve the clarification. Thank you. Uh, due to the time constraint, we needed to move to the next presentation. Thanks again. Okay. Uh, Jay Kisling from UC Berkeley, who will delve into engineering the polycat hydrosynthesis or molecular foundry for advanced fuels and materials. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jay Kisling. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to see so many good friends. Um, welcome to JPay. Um, so today I'm going to uh, dig down deep into some work we've been doing on engineered polyketide synthesis. And um, just want to start off uh, with this slide. I think most of you know this, but we get almost all of our uh, fuels, chemicals, materials, uh, and even precursors for pharmaceuticals from petroleum. And, and it's a super efficient process. The chemistry is well developed. Uh, there's a number about 100,000 different molecules produced petroleum. And in the US, this accounts for roughly $2 trillion of our economy. That doesn't include pharmaceuticals. That's kind of the fuels and materials side. So it's a huge part of our economy. And um, I like to put this slide up. Um, because uh, synthetic chemists have been behind a lot of that chemistry that transforms those inexpensive substrates, cheap substrates, into valuable products for us. And um, that's a picture of E.J. Corey, who um, did really the last part of this, this 200 year flow chart, uh, going from uh, some very simple molecules like urea all the way to things like taxol. Um, and, and synthetic chemists can do really wonderful things uh, with synthetic organic chemistry. Um, now, we'd like to have a more renewable future, which means we'd like to take those petroleum feedstocks and replace them with things that are renewable, like cellulosic biomass. And uh, we've got a lot of it uh, around. Uh, the US alone uh, could produce about a billion dry tons of biomass. Um, and that could roughly produce 25% to 33% of our fuels. So a huge fraction of the fuels. Um, and also that note about high fructose corn syrup, of course, we'd like to take that out of our kids' drinks. Um, and so it turns out that there's a lot of high fructose corn syrup around uh, used inexpensively. But what we need is something as powerful as synthetic chemistry to transform those that biomass resource into all of those different products. And we need that to be in biology, or at least in part in biology. 
And so uh, this is really what motivated our work uh, almost, well, it's over a decade ago to start on polyketide synthesis. And I show here just some really interesting molecules, some of the really valuable molecules that are produced by type one polyketide synthesis. Um, and these enzymes are modular. Um, that means that each one of those uh, modules, let me just get my pointer up here. Um, each one of these modules basically accounts for two carbons on the backbone, plus the functionality, plus the uh, reductive state of those carbons. Um, and uh, if we look at the best known polyketide synthase, the erythromycin polyketide synthase, it's really a remarkable machine. Um, it's three gigantic proteins. Uh, each of them are greater than 300,000 Daltons uh, in their monomeric form. Um, and they're linked together with these uh, linkers that are protein linkers. Um, those circles represent domains. So you can think of those as an enzyme activity. Uh, it starts with a loading module that loads uh, an acyl-CoA from the intracellular milieu. It then extends it through the extension modules, in this case, six extension modules, till it gets to the end. And in this case, a thioesterase cleaves it off and gives you the final product. Um, now, I mentioned that these are very large enzymes. If we just take that module six, um, the, the structure for that is shown there, and that's the dimeric form of the structure. And, and that's a huge uh, enzyme, and it, it took a lot of work to get that structure. Um, just to put us all on the same page about the chemistry that they can perform, this is uh, the basic polyketide synthase. It contains a load, an extension module, and in this case, a uh, very simple termination. It loads an acyl-CoA using the acyl transferase, um, does the same thing in the extension module, and then the ketosynthase uh, attaches those together using a clasin condensation. Um, it, releases carbon dioxide, which drives the reaction forward. Um, and then the thioesterase cleaves it off, hydrolyzes it off. This is the simplest PKS. You could make it just slightly more complicated by adding a keto reductase, which would reduce the keto group to an alcohol. You could add a dehydratase, which would dehydrate, remove a water, and you get a double bond. And then you could add an enoyl reductase, which would reduce that double bond to a single so now you know most of the chemistry. There's, there's some more complicated chemistry, but we're not gonna go into it in my talk. Um, the keto reductase, important uh, fact here, uh, controls uh, not only the reducing state, but also the stereochemistry. It controls the stereochemistry, not only of the hydroxyl, but also of that R2 group that's on the C2 carbon. Um, so, there's ever since polyketide synthases were discovered to be these, these modular enzymes, it was hoped that they could be recombined in new ways. And out, through years, decades of sequencing genomes uh, from organisms in the environment, um, we found uh, literally you know, thousands of PKSs, um, and it could be up to hundreds of thousands by now. And that means that we have a huge number of modules that we could potentially recombine in new ways to produce new products. And, and the number of products is, is actually staggering. With, with a simple load, an extension module, and a termination, you can get almost a million different molecules. And I'm being a little conservative here. Um, you could probably get up more. Now, how do I do that calculation? Well, that extension module has the possibility of producing at least 100 different molecules because there are many acyl transferases that will load many different malonyl CoA analogs. Uh, and in addition, that KR controls the stereochemistry. So you've got four different stereochemistries from that diastereomer. So we can get up to some staggering numbers. Um, now, can we uh, do any of that engineering uh, and do it in a way that will be productive? Um, so the goal of our work in the lab is not to explore these uh, extremely complicated polyketide synthases that are producing antibiotics and other important therapies. There are so many great scientists out in the world doing that. Our work more is to see if we can recombine these in new ways, put them into a microbial host and get it to produce some interesting product.
I want to just uh, talk a little bit about um, activity of these PKSs because they're known to be slow enzymes uh, in their full form. Now, realize that this enzyme is doing all the steps that might be in a metabolic pathway that has distributed enzymes. So, you know, for a polyketide synthase like the picromycin synthase, um, we're talking about, you know, 20, 30 domains here, which would be 20 or 30 steps in a biosynthetic pathway where you have distributed enzymes. Um, the turnover number for the picromycin PKS, which is one of the higher ones that's been measured, is around 37 per minute. And that means that if you want to produce a product at a gram per liter per hour, you'd need approximately 5% of the total salt protein. That's not out of the range of possibilities. Um, but when we're talking about things like fuels that you might want to produce in excess of 5 grams per liter per hour, um, that would be get to be pretty high. Okay, so I'm going to give you some simple examples from my lab where we've tried to do some chemistry with them. And I'm going to start off with kind of the simplest example that we did several years ago. And then we're going to get into some more recent things, uh, several of which uh, are not published yet. Uh, so the first is polyester monomers. So you know how polyester is made. It's a condensation of an acid and an alcohol. And if you wanted to produce the simplest uh, uh, hydroxy acid to make into a polyester, um, it might look like that molecule right up there. And I've got that dashed line there because if you remember, I said every module adds two carbons to the backbone. So if you're doing retrobiosynthesis, you would calculate back two carbons, um, and that's where you'd have a break in your modules. Um, so to make this molecule, we need an ex uh, a load module, an extension module, and then a thioesterase to give us this acid group. Uh, and it would load an acyl-CoA, it would extend with a malonyl-CoA analog, and then of course the thioesterase would clean it off. Okay, so to make this, we started with something really simple, it was well known, the lipomycin PKS. Um, we took the load and first extension module from that, and we took the thioesterase from the erythromycin PKS. Um, and we chose the lipomycin PKS because it's uh, promiscuous in its load. It will load several different things onto uh, the, the load module, and that would give us a variety of resulting hydroxy acids. And so when we did that, we started out with uh, these uh, various acids we extended with methyl malonyl CoA because that's its natural extension. And we got these two methyl, three hydroxy acids. Um, and we were able to produce all of these in vitro to a certain extent, some better than others. Now, uh, we wanted to exchange that methyl group at the two position with another. Um, substituent or with no substituent. And that requires then that we exchange the acyl transferase on that simple PKS. Now there's literature out there for exchanging those acyl transferase. And we had a variety of possible malonyl-CoA analogs that we could use to extend that molecule. Now, uh, the first thing we did was look to how look for how we could exchange that acyl transferase. And this is an uh, old paper. I won't go into it in any amount of detail, but where you make the cleavage, the, the exchange point for exchanging in a domain makes a huge difference because it can affect the folding of the resulting PKS. And we had a variety of choices for exchanging in the acyl transferase um, and I won't belabor that too much, but one stood out as being clearly the winner here. And that's where we had part of the KSAT linker and part of the post-AT linker included with that acyl transferase. And it's just shown here in this structure. If you don't include those linkers, you leave out a significant amount of the acyl transferase. And this, in fact, was what was kind of accepted in the literature before we did this work. Um, and if you include those linkers, it looks like you've got now a complete uh, acyl transferase. Now, um, this is only one example. We wanted to be able to do this over and over and over again. 
Um, oh, and sorry, when you make that change um, in vitro, you can then produce all of these same hydroxy acids now being extended with malinyl-CoA, and, and none of them have a methyl in that two position. Okay, so we wanted to, to see if we could do this more readily, if we could come up with something general that would allow us to exchange these acyl transferases. Um, and uh, what we knew is that when you improperly insert a domain into a PKS module, it becomes unfolded. And uh, you could see that in the insoluble protein on a gel. You could see it uh, using proteomics. Um, and so we wanted to see if we could detect when an insoluble protein is being produced and use that to then screen for the cleavage points or the insertion points for that basal transferase. Um, so uh, we attached to the uh, C terminus a GFP. And the idea was that if it's properly folded, that GFP, if the PKS is properly folded, that GFP would be properly folded. And therefore, we'd have green fluorescence. And the higher the folding, the more fluorescence. And we placed under the control of a promoter that detects unfolded protein inside the cell, an uh, RFP uh, that would, when it's uh, got a lot of red fluorescence, would indicate uh, unstable protein uh, or improperly folded protein. And when there's low red fluorescence, that it's properly folded. So there you've got two measures to detect um, protein folding inside the cell. And then we took three controls. Uh, one is uh, uh, the DEBS uh, mod six uh, with it, it's just native acyl transferase. We know that's soluble from the literature. We didn't do that, but um, we know that from the literature. There's this D1 that has an acyl transferase exchange that makes it kind of soluble. And then there's a completely insoluble one with a different acyl transferase exchange. And we showed that when you've got uh, the native protein, you get a uh, uh, high, uh, sorry, when you've got a native protein, you get high red and uh, low GFP. When you've got it, uh, sorry, I've got this, I've got this reversed on here. Um, this should be uh, the green here. Um, when you have a very soluble protein, you have a high GFP, a low red, when you've got a uh, very insoluble protein, you get a high RFP and a low red, uh, sorry, you get a high M cherry. <laughs> this, is a, this is challenging. And when you got medium solubility, you get a little of each. Okay, let's get off this slide. <laughs> okay, now, so the question is, um, where do we make the junction with that acyl transferase? swapped in. So uh, we took uh, basically primers on either side of the acyl transferase. We looked for different junctions and looked for the degree of green versus red. And then we could sort these using uh, uh, cell sorting. And we could look at the amount of red fluorescence and the amount of green fluorescence. And we could then classify them by low solubility, medium solubility, and high solubility. Then we took samples from each one of those and we looked for activity. And shown here is the solubility coefficient as a function of this region between the KS and the AT. And you can see there's places where it's got high solubility and places where it's got low solubility. And if you look at the activity then as a function of that solubility, you see that the regions that are insoluble right here have the lowest activity and the regions that are the most soluble have the highest activity. So that in fact told us that solubility is pretty good indicator of activity. And we can now use this to find the junctions where to substitute in um, the acyl transferase. And just shown on this structure shows the regions, good regions for recombination and bad regions for recombination. And that's right in here and right in here. Okay. 
All right. So then we ask the question, how promiscuous are acyl transferases? If we want to exchange an acyl transferase, um, will they, you know, how promiscuous are they? Can we use them to, to load their natural substrate? Can we even use them to load unnatural malonyl-CoA analogs? And so I've already shown you that there are a variety of acyl transferases that are available, that are known in the literature. Um, and there are also some ones that aren't known in the literature that we wanted to see if we could substitute in. So again, we took this DEB module six. Um, we uh, started with a snack uh, and then we tested various acyl transferases with various malonyl-CoA analogs. And uh, here's the uh, acyl transferases and the native uh, malonyl-CoAs that they are supposed to be able to load um, uh, from the literature. And here's the matrix of uh, all of the acyl transferases and the malonyl-CoA analogs that we tested. And you can find this in this paper that was just published in JAX. Now, red means that they didn't work. Green means they did work. And yellow is somewhere in between. And this is a lot of information, but I'll tell you that there are some acyl transferases that are very promiscuous. If we look at some of these, like the EPO uh, mod 4 AT, the Menensin 5 uh, AT, they will load a variety of malonyl CoA analogs. Um, and some of them, though, are not very uh, promiscuous at all. Uh, on the other hand, there are some malonyl CoA analogs that are nearly impossible to load. And here's a really interesting one. EPO4 um, will load malonyl CoA, but none of the others tested would load malonyl CoA. So they're able to discriminate against malonyl CoA, even though EPO4 um, would say like to load uh, something like this allyl malonyl CoA. Um, so really interesting uh, data. We, we um, looked at this uh, using AlphaFold. Uh, we don't have a perfect model um, for how they discriminate, um, but we need to get there. Okay, um, so uh, I showed you a lot about um, hydroxy acids um, and how we learned how to exchange ATs. I wanna now uh, apply this um, to a couple of other examples. Um, and the first one is uh, lactams for nylons. And uh, Namil Lee will be giving a presentation uh, later in this meeting, and he's going to give you a lot more details. But um, all of this work uh, was uh, his and um, uh, collaborating with uh, some of his colleagues in the lab. And um, it's really beautiful work, and I'm happy to highlight it here. Um, so I think you know about caprolactam. It's in nylon six. We use lots of it, no, 5 million tons a year. We use much less valerolactam, and that's because it's a little more difficult to get, um, but it has some really interesting properties. Um, for instance, uh, it has a, a higher melting and thermal stability than uh, usual commercial nylons, um, and it has ferroelectric properties, um, and it's a a promising candidate in the future for uh, microelectronics. But again, it hasn't been uh, explored in great detail. Now, we wanted to see if we could make valerolactam and derivatives that might have interesting side groups on them, interesting functionality that we could use. And, and the first thing we did is try to predict how to polymerize valerolactam. One of the reasons it's not used is because it isn't uh, the ring isn't strained enough. It's got six members in the ring, so it's it's perfectly, you know, it, it, it doesn't open easily. It's just happy being closed um, in the lactam form. And so you have to apply a fair amount of heat um, to get it to open up and polymerize, and you've got this chance of it then uh, burning. And uh, we did a calculation, and the calculation showed that if you have the right substituents on that ring, you might be able to um, open it up easier, cause more strain on the ring. Now, if you want to make valerolactam, where are you going to start? What's the PKS? Well, the PKS for us uh, is the fluvirocin PKS. It's, uh, there aren't a lot of PKSs that make lactams. It's one of them that makes lactams. 
uh, and it makes this uh, large black tambourine here, we wanted something much smaller. So how do you get that? Well, one way you can get that is just to move the thioesterase to the point of the PKS where you want to cleave it off and cyclize it. So you could do that. Um, and then you'd have an unnatural junction here between the ACP and the thioesterase. And this would give you ethyl valerolactam as a product. You could also move module five forward to just after that first KS. Uh, that would give you essentially the same product, but it would give you a different junction now between the KS and the AT rather than between the ACP. Now, a little bit about the load. The load is really interesting. It's got uh, a few enzymes uh, that act on uh, aspartate um, before it gets converted into um, this FLVL um, that gets loaded onto the polyketide synthase. And it actually has a protective group here to keep it from, I think, cycleizing and falling off the enzyme early. And this is actually in the fluvirocin PKS. Uh, so the first thing we had to do was characterize the loading and, and, uh, the, and, and all that functionalization up to the loading. And uh, Namil did that and showed that, uh, in fact, we get um, all of the proper molecules, all everything that we expect being loaded on to this uh, ACP load. And then we had to actually implement this uh, in, in practice inside the cell. And that meant that not only do we have to have all of those load enzymes expressed at the right level, and Namil had to make many variants of them to get the right ones uh, properly expressed. We have to express that extension module, but we also have to produce ethyl malinyl coa which is used as an extension. So we did all of that. It took, let me just say this, we tested many variants um, and we get about two megs per liter. It's not very high production, but it's enough that uh, we could then test swapping out the acyl transferases. So we wanted to exchange the acyl transferase. Um, we wanted to make all of these potential derivatives of valerolactam. Um, and so we made acyl transferases uh, from a number of different PTSs uh, in a number of different um, codon usages. Uh, these were then swapped in. But we've also got to produce all the malonyl-CoA analogs because we want to do this from sugars inside the cell. We're purists in that way. Um, and so here are the pathways for all of those uh, malonyl-CoA, and in a couple of cases, malonyl-ACP analogs that we need for extension. Um, we put those inside the cell. We also have to deprotect this molecule before it can be cyclized. And it turns out that this was a particular limitation for us. And that by overexpressing that FLVJ, we got higher titers of our final desired valerolactam derivatives. And this just shows that um, we can produce uh, these various valerolactam derivatives. Again, not at high levels when you express the FLVJ that's shown by that green line, we get higher levels, uh, the orange lines versus the gray uh, bars um, of the titers of those products. Um, we've since shown that we can produce aloe valerolactam and benzyl valerolactam. Um, we still have some work on hydroxy, methoxy, and amino valerolactam. Okay, um, a couple of more quick examples. Uh, plastics. Uh, plastics are a huge problem. And by the way, you're going to hear, you can hear a lot more details um, from Namil in his talk uh, later in this meeting. Um, so plastics are a huge problem. You know that we have uh, mounds of them and oceans of plastics. And one of uh, my colleagues here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Brett Helms, developed uh, a way to uh, develop recyclable plastics based on polydiketoenamines. And the, the, the crux of this is that you can use acid to depolymerize these, acid and heat, and you can get the monomers of those plastics back in pure form. And this is something that's nearly impossible to do with 
any other plastics. We hear about it um, with PET bottles, but um, in every cycle of recycling, um, you lose a lot of plastic. And as a result, a lot of the plastic ends up in things like fence posts and board replacements for decks. Um, and this is really to solve this problem of the global polymer flows and recycling polymers. Now, what Brett has shown is that it doesn't matter what dyes you put into those plastics, what kind of fibers you put into those plastics, you can get the monomers back in pristine form by adding acid, cheap acid, and some heat. Now, we wanted to see if we could produce these using renewable feedstocks. When Brett did his original work, he did it using petroleum monomers. Can we actually produce these um, from lignocellulosic biomass? And rather than use Brett's original monomers, uh, we decided to use lactones. In fact, uh, we decided to use beta keto uh, delta lactones, shown right here um, as the monomer for these uh, highly recyclable plastics. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is figure out which of those we to use. There are literally thousands that we could potentially make using polyketide synthases. So we used computational chemistry, and this is from Kristen per Persons group, um, to figure out which one of those monomers would be the best ones or which ones of them would be the best ones. And that gave us essentially uh, the best monomers to use with the best functional groups. Um, and that then would recommend to us what PKS to make. Um, so we uh, essentially took the uh, polyketide synthase modules. We needed a load. Uh, uh, two extension modules and a thioesterase to get these beta keta delta lactones with various R1 and R2 groups uh, in the uh, four and five positions. Now, the great thing about polyketide synthesis that I already mentioned is that you can control the stereochemistry. So we can control the stereochemistry of uh, the R1 position. We can control the stereochemistry of the R2 position. Um, we can also control what substituents are in those points. And those affect the temperature and the pH at which you deconstruct the plastic. And one of the really exciting things that came out of this is that depending on the R groups that you use on that R1 and R2 position, you can change the temperature of deconstruction pretty dramatically. And where this will be important is composite plastics. Um, almost every plastic we use is a composite of multiple plastics. And it's really difficult to recycle composite plastics. What this gives you is the possibility of pulling off one layer at one temperature or one pH, increasing the temperature and pH and pulling off another layer. So you could get those monomers back in pure form and deconstruct these laminated plastics. Okay, um, so I, I wanna just close with a couple of thoughts about um, designing and PKSs for synthetic chemistry. And, and you heard this from women already uh, in terms of using biofoundries. Um, I wanna go back to this uh, first slide that I put up of the history of synthetic organic chemistry. E.J. Corey, besides being uh, a, an amazing synthetic organic chemist, um, also very early on developed software for trying to plan out synthetic organic chemistry. In fact, his first software dates back to the 60s. And he tried to capture that brain, that marvelous brain that knew so much about synthetic chemistry um, in a computer program. And uh, this is really inspiring. And, and these are used in synthetic organic chemistry. And the question is, can we use that in building PKSs? And can we go even farther uh, and use uh, robotics, uh, which you saw from him in, um, to do some of the construction? Um, so uh, we threw a, a, an um, Agile Biofoundry grant, We've been developing both the software and the hardware for building PKSs. Um, the software is based on some software that uh, is called Cluster CAD. Um, and it really takes in all of the information about PKSs that's been known over uh, and, and gleaned over the past few decades 
um, and tries to scour that information and find PKSs that will be useful um, for our endeavors. And just to give you an example of some old work, we, we crafted a PKS to produce a dipic acid several years ago, and it's really a hybrid of many PKSs, domains from many different PKSs. Uh, and then we tested that software to see if that would come up with the same uh, designs um, that, that we found in that original paper. Um, so the software, you can actually find it uh, on the JBay website. Uh, you can use a ChemDraw-like interface to draw in the molecule you want to make, and then you can have it choose modules for you. So in this case, it chose uh, the starting module from Borelidin, and this is in fact the one we chose in our paper. Um, then you can ask it to identify a reductive loop. And the reductive loop that we used is number 254 on its list. That means there might have been some better ones uh, that we should have chosen. Um, we, can, uh, we needed to find an alternative dehydratase domain. And so, in fact, the one that we used is number three on that list. And finally, the thioesterase to hydrolyze it from the PKS. Uh, the one we use is number 258, which means there might have been 257 better ones. Um, and then we've been building out uh, just on the other side of this hallway um, uh, the, the biofoundry for PKS engineering. And it uses a lot of different tools and it still has humans. Uh, not women's, but humans to carry, <laughs> to carry the, uh, the samples uh, uh, between the various machines. We're not quite as sophisticated as women, uh, but uh, we, we're trying to get there. Um, so uh, just in summary, uh, what I've shown you is that polyketide synthases have significant potential to produce all kinds of different interesting molecules. We've been working on some really simple hybrid PKSs. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, there are many unknowns still in the PKS world, which I think will keep me busy, at least to retirement. Um, but I think we can make a lot of gains by developing and using retrobiosynthesis software and automation hardware. Um, and that will really help us not only with the science, but also with the engineering and the application. And um, over the years, uh, so many people have have helped with this work and I'd like to thank them. And we've gotten funding from so many different sources and I'd like to recognize that funding. And with that, uh, I think I'm finished. I'd be happy to take any questions. For your engaging insight and groundbreaking modes of Yale. And so it is time for question and answer. Uh, this is uh, interesting. So. This uh, PKS pathway use uh, CoA substrate. Yes. And also use uh, maybe NADPH for the yep. reduction. So that means uh, these are also very limiting thing yep. in the cell. Speaking of those availability, what are the what would be the best host to strain for making PKS at the level we are talking about? That's that's a great question. So um, uh, it depends. Um, it turns out that the picromycin PKS works in E. coli pretty well. Uh, none of these work in yeast, none of the, I shouldn't say none. There are a limited number that work in yeast. Um, we often use streptomyces for a lot of our work. Streptomyces are challenging to engineer. They're do it's totally doable, but it's, it's challenging uh, and slow going. Um, we've started working Kareni bacterium um, which works pretty well. The work that I showed you from Namil on the, uh, the Valero lactam derivatives was done in Pseudomonas. I think there's quite a few possibilities. Uh, Bacillus, Subtilis is another great one. Um, but you're right. Uh, they require NADPH. They require CoAs. Um, but a lot of other uh, pathways require those as well, especially if we're talking about reduced products that we want to make from from sugar. So, you know, I think the lesson here is um, the back of the envelope calculations will tell you which molecules, which kinds of molecules are approachable and which ones are really out of range for polyketides and bases. So then one immediate to target host may be oleaginous yeast, which is very good at making malonic OA and a DPH. Well, what are the critical limitations for using that kind of oleaginous yeast strain for PKS? Yeah, so, so it's a great question. Um, 
we know that when we take PKSs from uh, filamentous fungi and put them, we can express those in Saccharomyces. Uh, we could probably put them into an oleaginous yeast, no problem. Some of the bacterial PKSs, well, most of the bacterial PKSs don't work well in yeast. Um, and so that's a limitation. Now, the streptomyces, the, the ones from filamentous fungi tend to be uh, more iterative PKSs. There are a few, of just a few examples of, of non-iterative PKSs. Um, I think there's a lot of work that could be done there. I wish somebody would take it on. Thank you. Yes. Well, great talk. Uh, uh, to make a monomer, plastic monomer, yes. a kind of comp compound, we need a very uh, fast engine and use that PKS engine yeah so it's a great question so it you know if um the answer is yes you can it depends you probably don't want to use it for disposable plastics you'd want to use it for things like they, where you get the monomer back and then you only have to worry about the first cycle that is the, because if you get the monomer back then uh, essentially you don't have to do biosynthesis again because you're, you're recycling it. Um, and it turns out that if you use a, a relatively good PKS for producing the BKDL uh, and you produce it from cellulosic biomass um, and we get up to say the rates that we've gotten there, we've done techno-economic analysis and um, you can produce polyurethanes, for instance, that are about the expense, a little, actually they're more expensive than polyurethane we have now. But when you do the recycling, it's much cheaper by say, it's 20% it's of cost when you do the recycling. So I guess the, the, the real answer to your question is if you're gonna produce um, plastics that are used in things like mattresses and car seats, things where you're going to get it back, furniture, for instance, then uh, we can achieve that. If you're going to do it in disposable plastic bags, you're never going to be able to reach um, the cost of polyethylene and polypropylene. And thanks for your last presentation. Yeah, thank you again. The first speaker is Professor Alicia from the University of Delaware. She's going to talk about how it's done the genetic codes. Thank you all for the opportunity. And thanks everyone also uh, for attending this. Welcome here. Um, it's a really hard act to follow, you know, saying, yep, Jay Kiesling and Quayman, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm Aditya Kunjapur. I've been at the University of Delaware since January 2019. So I'm in a very different career stage. And please keep that in mind during my talk. Um, but I am really excited to share with you, especially this year, we had a, a few publications come out. Some of our different directions, um, especially with a focus on building block chemistries and how pairing that with an expanded genetic code can allow us to do some more, you know, original kind of applications in synthetic biology, definitely less mature than some of the areas that we've heard about earlier today. Um, so we all know here that engineered microbes can serve diverse roles. And I'd like to argue that some of these could be useful for functions outside of traditional bioreactors. Um, so we know and we've developed over many, many years. I looks like my laser pointer and, and also for the people online, it might yeah, be easier to use the, so use the yeah. Uh, okay. Can we see that? Great. Um, so we, we've obviously discussed uh, many of us being from the metabolic engineering kind of community, the uh, valuable role that microbes can make and uh, can serve in producing chemicals, many of which are chemicals we actually want. For example, in the rhizosphere, 
as you know, herbicides or plant growth promoting um, molecules or in our guts, in our bodies, as nutraceuticals, et cetera. Um, you know, there are all these uh, dynamic, environmentally responsive sensors that we've created in genetic circuits. Um, and imagining those in certain settings could allow controlled actuation of certain processes. You could have microbes break down compounds we don't want in the environment. Um, and uh, also uh, microbes play very key roles in modulating immune health. Um, so, something must have happened when I picked the laser pointer. Okay, there we go. So you can imagine uh, then this sort of um, uh, utopian world that could potentially be within reach if we take some strides towards it, where we actually then utilize engineered microbiome. <laughs> um, in the environment, um, in distributed settings, so that they can lead to improved planetary health. Uh, so uh, if we want to go towards this vision, there are several challenges that we need to solve. Um, but some that my group is particularly focused on is uh, that engineered cells are limited by what they can make and where they can make it. Um, if we look at the what they can make, side of the house. Um, we know that biology does have a d diverse array of building block chemistries, but if we think about the building blocks of our macromolecules that are some of the key actors in cells, particularly proteins, enzymes, we have a relatively limited amount of functional group, chemical functional group diversity that's mostly illustrated here, for example, as the kinds of things we see in our amino acid side chains. Um, and then we also have this model, that, uh, this paradigm of centralized biomanufacturing with then the um, perspective that we heard from Sang Yip Lee of you know, the downstream processing required to, um, to facilitate the purification of molecules, several of which are really needed, for example, for drug products, maybe also for some materials. But there are a wide range of compounds that actually we are eventually going to you know, release in the environment or consume potentially as a mixture. So, you know, there may be opportunities where we don't need that kind of purity. Okay. Um, I would like to argue also that my lab is very interested in building block chemistries and their diversification. And we've seen that in some of the other talks today as well, because building blocks are really versatile. So if you imagine, for example, this red uh, circular Lego, you could uh, imagine using that in many different kinds of compositions. Here, a stoplight, it's the red light, um, but also given our location, you could imagine that it uh, decorates something more complex, maybe a higher value product like the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so in my lab, uh, we engineer at multiple subcellular scales, protein engineering, metabolic engineering, and genome engineering. And we're guided by four hypotheses in particular that kind of unites our different projects. One is a common uh, perspective shared in the field, which is that uh, if we find promiscuous biocatalysts, then as long as they maintain chemo selectivity, we can use these to design more platform pathways to diversify our products. Um, now, one of the more uh, uh, unique takes in my lab is that if we can biosynthesize some of these building blocks, then we're imagining that cells <laughs> can autonomously make these macromolecules uh, from these simple carbon sources in whatever environments they may be. It gives them a little bit more of an ability to have a distributed manufacturing kind of paradigm. Another um, uh, focus in, in my career in particular is this idea that as you try to expand functional group chemistry in cells, there are many kinds of cellular enzymes, families, many of which are redundant, that can compete with the reactions that you want, counteracting, for example, uh, the formation of a particular functional group. Um, and I'm under a belief that we can actually, in many cases, uh, overcome this through combinatorial gene deletions. And I'll try to show you a few examples. Actually, I actually have all of these today, including our fourth hypothesis, which is that if we can engineer a dependence on an artificial or very rare building block, then we can also use that for biological containment which is going to be very important for responsibly using any kind of engineered microbe outside of React. Um, and, you know, as I just highlighted, and maybe as this video that is lagging very much on the screen shows, um, this is just an animation kind of depicting if you had engineered microbes, uh, really capturing this idea that, okay, your microbes are making compounds, the one you want, other compounds as well. But like any kind of microbe, 
they would grow and divide. And so you have this challenge in the field of you don't want to introduce genetically engineered microbes into various settings because you can't guarantee that they're only going to stay in that setting. They could become an invasive species. But I think we can use synthetic biology to actually help try to tackle this challenge so that we use essentially technology and new capabilities to create safeguards. And so in my lab, we work in three different areas, all focused on the idea of using um, the of designing biosynthetic pathways to rare building blocks or to harness rare building blocks to create these capabilities and safeguards. Um, among our three areas, we have a portfolio of projects where we valorize wastes, um, either derived from plastic or biomass. And what we're doing is we're selectively introducing amine functionality. Um, and so a lot of this is uh, proof of concept enzyme biocatalytic cascades that we then try to transition into whole cell cascades. <laughs> and in some cases, fermentation. I won't actually talk about any of this work today, but you can see a few papers from earlier this year. What I will focus on, in particular, one main example is our work on non-standard amino acid biosynthesis. So here, related to the talk title, we're leveraging the idea that chemical biologists have allowed us to access expanded genetic codes. And uh, non amino acids that are not part of the normal 20 that are used in ribosomal translation. And I'll tell you later in my talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, and so here, if a cell can biosynthesize the non-standard amino acid that it is also capable of inserting within a protein, now it can autonomously access an augmented array of protein biochemistry. And I'll try to give you at least one example where that's useful. And lastly, uh, related to the safeguards and biocontainment, uh, we work on synthetic oxytrophy where we engineer microbes to rely on non-standard amino acids. And if I have time, I'll tell you about that as well. So let's start with non-standard amino acids. One of the motivations for which we are, we're looking for a particular kind of functional group chemistry that's not present in cells is immunomodulation in order to create more effective vaccines. In particular, vaccines against antimicrobially resistant bacteria. And so this uh, chart here, sorry, I'm always tempted to use the, uh, laser, the laser pointer. I should just put this down. Um, <laughs> this chart just basically shows what we're all pretty familiar with, which is this idea that actually in the uh, arms race against, uh, of antibiotics against evolution, uh, this, is, this continues to be a race in which the winner is, is somewhat unclear because uh, you know, these are the times in which antibiotics have been deployed and this is when resistance is observed. And you know, we've seen that in some cases that gap uh, unfortunately decrease. And because of this, antimicrobial resistant related deaths are expected in 2050 to be 10 million annually across the globe. Um, and we see this even today, even in the United States, you know, some of this right now is more in uh, regions of the world that are a little bit more burdened, say by Shigella and other uh, diarrheal diseases. But even in the US and among the elderly or hospital acquired infections, we're seeing a lot of antibiotic uh, resistance. And so then one of these uh, approaches, well, there's a series of approaches one could use. You could try to develop new antibiotics, but if you wanted to also uh, develop a new uh, type of vaccine modality, we were wondering whether there might be strategies to increase immune response to a target protein. And this led us to the work of Peter Schultz, who first showed with paranitro l phenylalanine, this non-standard amino acid here, that it was immunogenic and could specifically break immune tolerance. So let me tell you briefly what that means. Um, in his case, originally in 2008, they were interested in essentially teaching a mouse, almost like an immunotherapy, to mount a response, an antibody response against its own TNF-alpha, a cytokine that mediates uh, inflammatory responses. And of course, TNF-alpha is a self-protein. So if you take murine TNF-alpha and you administer it to mice, you see that it's tolerated and there is no immune response. But what he showed is that you could take a single surface residue and substitute it with the paranitrophenylalanine and now when you administer that, you actually do get a humoral response and it's cross-reactive. So later studies showed that actually what was happening was T cells were presenting a neo-epitope. Uh, it was strengthened antigen presentation. Um, and sorry, antigen presenting cells were presenting a neo-epitope that strengthened T cell replication. 
uh, recognition. And that activated B cells that led to the polyclonal anti antibody response. It's cross-reactive, meaning it doesn't rely on the nitro group for the recognition. So you can actually get immunization against proteins uh, in other regions. And then this strategy was later applied to other self proteins in both autoimmune type of disorders as well as cancer. But a challenge with all of these studies is that um, there was a very uh, aggressive immunization effort. Um, in one case, eight injections over 17 days at multiple sites. So one of the topics we were thinking about, given our synthetic biology expertise, and actually the history of some of the vaccines that were first developed, which were live attenuated vaccines or killed whole cell vaccines. We know that actually cells can be attractive as vaccines, in part, especially if they're live but attenuated, because they can mimic pathogens. You know, essentially showing the tropism that a pathogen might and also producing the antigens that you'd like at the site of interest for a relevant local immune response. And in addition, having all the other cellular traits that function as an adjuvant. But of course, when you've got a live cell, you have the cell cellular milieu and you have limited tools to be able to direct the immune system to pay attention to say one antigen. Many bacteria have actually well-conserved antigens that are just very weakly immunogenic. So we looked at this and wondered, could we couple these technologies to try to help you know, shine a light on an antigen that might have, uh, you know, flew under the radar uh, before. So this is work in case I have to rush uh, that you can check out um, in Nature Chemical Biology came out in the July issue, um, led by Neil Butler, where we then coupled the metabolic uh, pathway design to paranitrophenylalanine, an unnatural amino acid that had previously never been biosynthesized, um, along with genetic code expansion technology. And so I will assume, hopefully correctly, that the audience here is more familiar with metabolic engineering than genetic code expansion. So I'll go quickly through the metabolic engineering and spend more time on the, uh, the genetic code expansion. But in general, this is a non-standard aromatic amino acid. Uh, so we go via the aromatic amino acid biosynthesis pathway and redirect flux from chorisme through actually its precursor of paranitrophenylalanine, which is this paraaminophenylalanine. That is a well-known natural product involved, for example, even in chloramphenicol biosynthesis. So the main innovation from a pathway perspective here was identifying an N-oxygenase, a non-heme diiron and monooxygenase that would catalyze a six electron oxidation of an amine to a nitro compound. And then of course, all this stuff here. So let me talk to you a little bit about this stuff here, and I have some slides uh, on that later. So you, you would need to introduce what's called an orthogonal translation system to help this non-standard amino acid once made get attached to tRNA, and that tRNA would help guide it to a particular codon that you have in your protein of interest. So how does that work? Um, you know, the chemical biology community has shown that you can reassign to some extent the building blocks of life. We have this universally conserved genetic code um, and of course, it's a redundant code, uh, degenerate at least. And so typically speaking, the stop codons are the rarest. Among them, the UAG codon is the most rare. And because it ordinarily has the function of stop, it's more easy to tell if you have reassigned it to a sense codon rather than nonsense. And so that is called amber codon suppression, when you suppress the amber stop codon and reprogram it to be a non-standard amino acid. You can do this simply by making a DNA edit in frame in your gene where you introduce a TAG. And your TAG then correspondingly in your mRNA is a UAG codon, and then you have a non-standard amino acid uh, inserted in that position if you have a functional orthogonal translation system. All the cell really requires in this case, the ribosome just needs a non-standard amino acid to be attached to the right tRNA. And Looks like, okay, yes. And so uh, what that then boils down to is your requirements for achieving this sort of site-specific incorporation of non-standard amino acids and then proteins is you supply a non-standard amino acid to the media or you program your uh, bacterium or organism to make it on its own. And it also has to make a tRNA that's simple enough to encode genetically as well as an amino acyl tRNA synthesis which is simply the enzyme that attaches amino acid to TR. 
Orthogonality, though, is very important. The tRNA can't be accepted by any of the other synthetases, and the synthetase can't um, accept any of the other native tRNAs. And so if you did this, then what you see here is that you would have a non-standard amino acid attached to tRNA, and the ribosome would readily accept it, you know, assuming it meets certain criteria, and your non-standard amino acid gets added to the growing peptide chain. So that's what is going on sort of in this bottom portion. And now I'll tell you a little bit about how we did this. Um, so first was our metabolic pathway uh, work where we first tried to recapitulate the biosynthesis of P-aminophenylalanine, which is pretty well known in the literature. And then with conditional to the overexpression of the OBA-C and oxygenase, we were able to first see paranitrophenylalanine form in the medium uh, after 24 hours at a pretty low titer of 100 micromolar. But one of the things I'll also mention here is when you have this idea of an autonomous bacterium producing molecules wherever it might be, the whole concept of the titers that you need really changes, right? We're not talking now about necessarily grams per liter of titers. We just need a metabolite titer that's enough for the cell to recognize it for translation. Um, and so that introduces both advantages and disadvantages that if you're curious about, I'll tell you later. Um, but in any case, with some further optimization, like consolidating the plasmids from two to one, as well as using an engineered host to uh, overproduce chorismate, we were able to get a little over 200 micromolar titers, but we were starting to see more PA fee relative to PN fee. And PA fee is also a non-standard amino acid. So we thought we need not only better titer of the red compound, but also lower of blue. And so naturally, if you have a lot of PA fee and not very much of your product, that's one enzyme that mediates that step, the N-oxygenase. So we looked in the genome, uh, in, in the genome databases, to see if we could mine a better N-oxygenase. And uh, in the n in the non-heme diarin and monooxygenase space, there are a few of these clusters, and this is a sequence similarity network, um, where there has been more work done relative to others. This cluster two that has chloramphenicol biosynthesis and oxygenase as well as ORF, which Weeman's lab has done a lot of work on. Uh, th this is a, a relatively better understood cluster. Um, our OBC was coming from cluster 13. And so we tried to sample actually a single uh, or more than one in some case, and oxygenase from all of these clusters. What we found is that actually only proteins tested from cluster 13 showed any activity in our in vivo screen when we supplemented PA fee. But then NO16 was better than OBC, both in vitro, in cells when overexpressed on its own, and when expressed in the context of the full biosynthetic pathway. When we had the full biosynthetic pathway then, under our improved conditions in uh, MOPS easy, rich, defined media, we were starting to now make, after 24 hours, nearly, uh, sorry, uh, okay, there we go, lag, <laughs> um, nearly a millimolar or a thousand micromolar of our, of our product, which is now getting very close to the amount that a chemical biologist would add to the medium. And this is just what we're detecting in the extracellular media. So we started to focus on then the genetic code expansion, uh, which is this portion here. So um, to do the genetic code expansion, we have our synthetase uh, and tRNA genetically encoded. And we use a reporter where we have an in-frame stop codon. And that tells us whether or not we get full length translation of a green fluorescent protein. The synthetase for increased orthogonality is from an archaeal species. It's from Methanococcus genasii, and it's been engineered by others in the past uh, to essentially have an, a more accepting binding pocket than its original role in, in charging tyrosine to tRNA. And so what we hope for in these assays is that when there's no NSA, if we actually have good fidelity for a non-standard amino acid and not the canonical amino acids, we would expect and hope to see that there's no GFP being formed. And then in the presence of the supply to PNV in this case, we would hope to see GFP. And so what we look for in these assays is a full change of fluorescence normalized to OD in the plus NSA versus no NSA case. And in the literature, there are so many of these derivatives of the MJTRS that are reported that we just screened a collection of enzymes that we had. Um, and we found a few that, that seemed to perform quite well. 
number 15 here being the best. Uh, what I want to show you is we also looked for selectivity against PA feed using a very similar kind of approach. And when we put all of these together, um, you know, now the cell has a biosynthetic pathway. It has the orthogonal translation machinery, and it has this green fluorescent protein reporter. And we're hoping to see it make uh, a green fluorescent protein that would have this uh, nitration uh, within it. And so if we just look at the titer of PNV, we can see that it greatly goes down with this additional burden of having to also make the orthogonal translation system and the reporter. Um, and also that it's quite delayed. I mean, a lot of what I've been telling you is about the titer at 24 hour, but at the, the small uh, scales that we're culturing, um, cells are entering stationary phase close to the eight hour mark earlier than that. And so really a lot of the protein translation is happening in this smaller window. Now we could get around that by doing a high cell density fermentation, but that's not relevant for a vaccine kind of context. So what we found as a result was we did see an intact MS and then in trypsin digested MS MS that, the, that most of our uh, protein, that the plurality is the peak that we expect with the paranitrophenylalanine, but that we also do have some impurities here where we did see that we were also incorporating PA feed. But if as desired, the PN fee is helping elicit a stronger immune response and directing the attention of say the patient's immune cells towards a protein, then it doesn't necessarily matter that there are these off target, uh, slightly impure products here. Uh, most likely they would be inert or maybe they would also be immunogenic. And we are doing uh, studies in collaboration with others, delivering uh, antigens that are nitrated or not to mice uh, to, to try to test more of those theories. Um, and this is just a summary of what I showed in this story, where we biosynthesize the unnatural amino acid. For sake of time, I just want to tell you a little bit about how we invested a lot of time and effort into one target. And that's probably illustrative of what we're generally trying to do. But we've also done some work to try to move this towards more of a platform pathway related to the idea of promiscuity and starting from precursors. So Michaela Jones has worked on uh, using a threonine transaldolase, which will accept aldehydes that have different substitutions and perform an aldol-like condensation with L-threonine to form beta-hydroxylated non serine amino acids that carry whatever functionalization may be on the aryl side chain, uh, and there's co-production of acid aldehyde. And the co-production of acid aldehyde actually makes this non-standard amino acid biosynthesis more thermodynamically favorable than most routes, because the acid aldehyde then is very readily reduced in cells, uh, driving this reaction forward. The only problem is the original threonine transaldolase uh, reported in the literature to do this has a threonine KM of uh, 40 millimolar, which is much higher than physiological levels. Um, so we went into the literature and did some genome mining here. Um, and we found in very distant clusters, again, using a sequence similarity network approach, that there were actually variants that not only have a lower KM, they have a higher KCAT, a higher DE, diastereomeric uh, selectivity, and they had a broader substrate specificity. So normally, some of these are actually, uh, you know, trade-offs with one another, but in this enzyme class, actually there were just, there are better variants than the original OBH. And talking to some who understand the enzymology here a little bit more, you would actually expect with a, a higher affinity for threonine uh, that you would get a higher DE, diastereomeric excess for the case of this reaction. And so now we've started to do these reactions in cells when, as they're growing. And we show, for example, with some of our uh, new variants that we do uh, better in terms of the beta hydroxylated non serine amino acid titer that we're trying to get. In particular, we do much better um, at lower concentrations of threonine, as you'd expect. Um, and so uh, I'll skip over that. Um, we can accept a few different chemistries. One of the concluding points I want to make is just that as we think about broadening the functional group chemistries, then, uh, as I hinted at earlier, there's some incompatibility sometimes with certain functional groups. I showed you nitro functional groups, and now in this platform pathway, aldehydes to get there. My group has done a lot of work on trying to figure out if we can stabilize these compounds. If we look at a panel of aldehydes here, eight that are biomass derived, and we supply them to cells as cells are growing, then we find in wild type MG1655 that they are reduced to their alcohol form. 
Um, and so these are generally not stable. But in my graduate work, we engineered a strain that accumulates these aldehydes by knocking out aldoketoreductases and alcohol dehydrogenases. And we never actually broadly looked at what that strain does for other chemistries. We were happy to see that it does still stabilize here in teal, the aldehydes now, um, at both four hours and 20 hours, which is not shown here for space. So that was good news as cells are growing or fermenting. But we were very surprised that when you take the same cells and now remove their carbon source and put them in a resting cell biocatalysis type of scenario, actually you see reduction and oxidation. And over time, it's actually a trend completely in the oxidation direction. That happens in MG1655, and it's sort of no surprise in the strain where reduction is eliminated, they oxidize. Um, and so to counter oxidation, since resting cell biocatalysis can be quite useful, we then in engineered deletions of aldehyde dehydrogenases. And so in this case, we have a reduced oxidation and reduction strain that has now about 12 deletions or so, six in either direction. And we find that its fitness is actually hardly altered under normal growth conditions. It's only when you give it the aldehyde that now it's, it really hurts you know, cell growth. But if the goal is resting cell biocatalysis, you can grow cells first. And then uh, once you have your biomass accumulation, you can supply aldehyde. And so we've shown techniques like that. So lastly, just related to safeguards, I just want to tell you what synthetic oxytrophy is. You can make cells rely on non-standard amino acids by modifying them to rely on a non-standard amino acid in one of their essential proteins. And this is work that first came out of George Church's lab where I did my postdoc, and we've been innovating on this in my lab. But rather than tell you about our innovations, I'll just try to explain the concept here which is, I already showed you that for a GFP, if you put an in-frame stop code on, you're forcing translation, full-length translation, to depend on the non-standard amino acid being present. You can do further changes to an essential enzyme to force its structure to accept only a particular kind of side chain. And that was done with Rosetta computational design in this study, where they made cells rely on biphenylalanine uh, and with escape rates that in some cases were undetectable, even when you grew a trillion cells. We put that through adaptive laboratory evolution. We actually thought it was gonna be evolution to break the containment, and that's what we were interested in. But we saw that the cells actually adapted to lower BIPA concentrations. And we've also taken these biocontained strains and put them directly in mammalian tissue culture. And the bacteria will gradually clear without need for antibiotics. So these could be potential avenues for collaborating, um, but we're doing a bunch of things, especially with rhizobacteria and microbial ecologies to try to use biocontainment to get closer to the field. And so as a final analogy, we're trying to expand the repertoire. If you imagine an artist doing that with four colors and going to 20, uh, with four colors or what nature already offers, you can already create uh, scenes that are understandable, but we hope with our additional chemistries, just like an artist would add meaning and nuance that we can do that too. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge my students, especially Neil, Michaela, uh, and uh, Roman, whose work I told you about today, my funding agencies, and mentioned that we're also looking to continue growing. Um, and thank you for your time. And I'll take any questions if there's time. Okay, last presentation. I, I might have missed what, what you, you already mentioned, but then you work with the incorporation of non-natural amino acid. Have you uh, erased all the amber codons from your host cells? Right, so that's a great question. Um, you know, having come from the church lab, we have E. coli strands that do have uh, all of the UAG stop codons reassigned and therefore um, can be dedicated to a non-serial amino acid. We actually found though, that as, as some of you may know, if you've used that strain, it has fitness issues and some other issues as well. Uh, we found that because of the biosynthetic flux and the resource burden was so significant, our best performance and what we published was in a wild type uh, E. coli strain, right. at least with regard to code, a non-recoded strain, I should say. Um, and we looked for and didn't see very much off-target incorporation of the non-steroid amino acid within the genes that natively end in UAG. That phenomenon actually in E. coli is documented to be relatively limited. It's more just that you would expect to lose some yield because you're competing with release factor one. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Did I go okay? Well, we have done other engineering in my lab uh, based on some of the adaptive laboratory evolution work I did while I was in the church lab. And we now have a strain that's recoded that is very fit, uh, almost indistinguishable from wild type and probably the best strain at incorporating non steroid amino acids. So there's that in our pipeline too. Thanks. Thanks, John. Last speaker of this session is Dr. Tehiri about CRISPR based pure technology through loaded inverter for antibiotic pre engineering markers. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Song. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about CRISPR-based programmable logic inverter for antibiotic-free synthetic biology. So basically, I have been developing the therapeutic microbes using the genetic circuit and CRISPR-based editor-based uh, recording system. So. Uh, you can see here the architecture of the my therapeutic microbes. Basically, we introduce the genetic circuit to sense the biomarker of the, some kind of the DGGs. And then using this kind of input signal, we make a, some kind of DNA recording system using CRISPR-based editor. And then at the same time, we can produce the, some kind of the uh, uh, treatment uh, molecules, something like uh, short chain fatty acid or the terpenoid. So and if we make this uh, therapeutic mic successfully, then this uh, therapeutic mic can sense the biomarker of the disease and then uh, treat the disease at the same time record the dead event in the DNA. But today I'm going to just uh, talk about the uh, antibiotic-free uh, selection of the multiple plasmids because uh, we have to select our therapeutic microbes in the gut. So we have to uh, develop the, some kind of antibiotic free selection of uh, uh, this kind of the microbes. So that's why we are developing this technology. So on the left, you can see the very, very basic uh, regulation system, the natural regulation system. When we uh, played out the uh, wild type bacteria into the uh, solid media with the antibiotics, then these wild type bacteria cannot grow at all because of the antibiotic effect, the toxic effect. So we analyze, we interpreted this kind of a natural regulation system into their single inverter or not gate. You can see here that when we add the antibiotics, the wild type bacteria cannot grow at all. So we uh, analyzed this, uh, system to a single inverter. But when we introduce the uh, plasmid with the antibiotic resistant gene, the wild type bacteria, then these engineered bacteria can grow with the uh, solid medium, the, in the solid medium with the antibiotics. Then these uh, antibiotics and antibiotic resistant genes uh, regulation system, we can interpret this uh, phenomena into the double inverter. So when, uh, you can see the, the first inverter can uh, antibiotic resistant gene. Antibiotic resistant gene uh, can make uh, uh, the inverted uh, the toxic signal into the uh, neutral signal, like a, a degradation of antibiotics. Then this input signal can make a, uh, the cell uh, growth recovery. So we can uh, interpret these uh, antibiotics and antibiotic resistant resistant genes mechanism into the double inverter in synthetic biology. So, you know, the, uh, there are many ways to make uh, this uh, inverter or not gate uh, in synthetic biology, but we, are, uh, we have been using the synthetic repressor. So already uh, Professor So and then other people uh, talk about the CRISPR and also the CRISPR based editor and CRISPR interference. So the CRISPR interference is basically is uh, in the, uh, is a synthetic repressor. So we can make uh, the NAT gate using the uh, CRISPR interference. So when we uh, target the uh, cellular essential gene using the CRISPR interference, then this is uh, basically uh, uh, 
uh, drive to the uh, growth in uh, cellular growth inhibition. So we can make uh, the single inverter using the CRISPR interference when we are targeting the essential gene of the uh, bacteria. But when we uh, when we we want to uh, want to make uh, um, a double inverter, then we have to uh, repress the this uh, sgRNA uh, to repress the cellular essential gene. We, uh, we call it here is the anti sgRNA. So we add the anti sgRNA in another plasmid. Then this uh, this uh, first CRISPR interference is inhibit the expression of the this. Uh, uh, growth inhibiting sgRNA. That means that the cellular growth inhibition is uh, de repressed, and then the cellular uh, cell growth is uh, started. Yeah. So uh, we can make uh, the double inverter using the just CRISPR I cascade. So that means when we are trying to uh, mimic the, the natural regulation of the antibiotics and the antibiotic resistant genes mechanism, then we just uh, simply uh, add the CRISPR interference cascade to uh, the, to mimic the data system. So, that, so our idea is very simple. So to make the first inverter system, we uh, made this uh, single inverter plasmid. So we uh, we introduced the, the uh, L-amnose induced promoter to express the Cas9 gene, and then the uh, the acid RNA is uh, controlled by the uh, constitutive promoter, and then uh, this acid RNA is targeting the uh, canamycin resistant gene in the same plasmid. So, if this plasmid is uh, successfully working, then the uh, the engineered bacteria with this uh, plasmid is susceptible to the canamycin. So we tested this uh, susceptibility of the, this uh, transformed E. coli in different concentration of the uh, canamycin. You can see here the uh, from 25 microgram per liter uh, per ml to 500 microgram per ml. We tested the different concentration of canamycin. And then you can see here, uh, we, when we increase the canamycin concentration, the cellular growth is uh, totally inhibited because the, uh, due to the, in, uh, the inhibition of the uh, expression of the uh, canamycin resistant gene. So this is the uh, first inverter. So we have to uh, add up the second inverter. So we, ha uh, we have to in insert some kind of the uh, rending path sequence into the first inverter plasmid. So we use the spare one side sequence. So the, you can see here the uh, basically, the spion side sequence is here. So, but we change a little bit, change of the, this sequence to add the pound sequence because the uh, we uh, when the second plasmid when we add the second plasmid, then the the, the also the the Cas9 uh, expressed from the second plasmid have to add, uh, bind to the uh, the first of this plasmid because. The, uh, the anti sgRNA is inhibit the expression of the, this uh, uh, cell growth inhibiting sgRNA. So that's why we add this kind of the PAM sequence. Uh, and then we also tested uh, the impact of the, this insertion of the PAM sequence of the cell uh, inhibition of the different concentration of the canamycin because there is no effect of the insertion of the, the PAM sequence into the, uh, this uh, inverter, si inverter system. So, to make a double inverter, we add another uh, plasmid. You can see here the, the second plasmid. The first plasmid is uh, like a landing pad plasmid because uh, uh, the another uh, the, the, the RP complex can bind here. So we add uh, this second plasmid without uh, any antibiotic resistant gene. This uh, plasmid just have this, this uh, uh, SH, anti sgRNA. So this first inverter can inhibit the cellular growth the in, when we increase the canamide concentration. But we, when we add the second plasmid, that means that the double inverter uh, can successfully working, then the cellular growth is recovered. So we can select the two plasmid uh, using just a single uh, antibiotic. So 
uh, yeah, we tested this system using the two plasma. So we add the uh, green fluorescence chlorine, the second plasma, and then at this time we add the uh, the ambitiously resistant gene in the second plasma because we want to com compare the antibiotic selection system with our crispr based selection system. That's why we introduced this uh, beta fructamase, uh, which is then seen here. So uh, the l lamnos and the SHRNA, uh, the means that we, this is the CRISPR uh, component. And then we also use the canamycin or canamycin plus ambitiolin. You can see here, when we are uh, selected these two plasmid using the canamycin and the ampicillin, then the right away the cell is uh, selected and maintained the, the, uh, this plasmid. But when we are using uh, the uh, just canamycin and then the, uh, the crispr -I, we have to transfer the cell to uh, uh, the general for the generation. You can see here initially only 7.9% cells are having their uh, two plasmid, but when we transfer the cells to uh, another growth, then then the 46 and the almost 84% uh, of the cells that harbor the two plasmid. You know, just using this uh, single canamide antibiotic. So we can uh, that that means that we can select the uh, two plasma using the, just the one single uh, antibiotic and then CRISPR interference double inverter. So one of the advantage of the CRISPR interference system is the modularity. You can uh, add another uh, growth inhibiting SGRNA. You can see here we are uh, in this case we are using the two SGRNA. That this uh, two SGRNA is inhibiting the uh, canamycin. Uh, antibiotic resistant gene here, but at the same time, we add the second and third plasmid. The second plasmid is inhibiting the, the this uh, 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 the inhibiting SGRNA, and then the uh, a third uh, plasmid had it has the uh, this anti SGRNA inhibiting the expression of the SGRNA in the landing pad plasmid. That means, and also these two plasmid doesn't have. Uh, don't have any uh, antibiotic resistance. Yet. That means uh, we can select the three plasmid using just one single antibiotic. So we tested this system using the uh, the, the second plasmid is the has the green progressions protein and then third pro, uh, plasmid has a uh, M cherry protein. So we tested this as uh, uh, selection system using the uh, uh, microscopy. You can see here without the uh, uh, L-lamnose, that means the no uh, CRISPR-I based double inverter. So we don't have many uh, uh, fluorescence cells, but when we add the L-lamnose, that means the, the CRISPR-I based the double inverter is successfully working, then we can select the, this, uh, uh, transform the cells with the doing plasmid using just a single uh, antibiotic. Uh, antibiotic. So now uh, we want to remove some, uh, reduce the concentration of the uh, canamycin, uh, the antibiotic, because uh, still we have to use the 200 microgram per ml of the canamycin to maintain the, this uh, landing pad plasmid. But when we targeting the uh, cellular essential gene instead of the uh, can canamycin resistant gene, then we can reduce the, uh, the concentration of the canamycin. Then it, uh, at the same time, we uh, re uh, inhibit the uh, expression of the cellular essential gene. So uh, in, in this case, we, uh, we just use the 20, uh, 25 microgram per ml of the canamycin to maintain the, this uh, the atlantic health slot. Uh, Plasmid. So the uh, the doctor uh, professor so is already mentioned about that the GABA gene. GABA gene is an essential gene in E. coli uh, cell growth. So we are targeting the GABA gene. So you can see here the um, our designed SGRNA is inhibiting the ex expression of the GABA uh, gene, and then the cell growth is uh, totally inhibited. So we are using this kind of the SGRNA to inhibit the uh, expression of the gamma gene. 
So you can see here, uh, we basically we have the same uh, last two last name. The second one has a uh, uh, GFP and the third one is MTV. But in this case, we are targeting the GABA gene instead of the uh, the canomycin resistant gene. So then, so we can reduce the uh, concentration of the canomycin from 200 micron per ml to 25 micron per ml. So you can see here, we are successfully uh, uh, select and then maintain the three plus and using the 25 micron per ml of the canomycin in uh, complex media. So we uh, applied our uh, uh, this developed the system to produce the uh, terpenoid in E. coli. So we have been uh, studying uh, minus alpha B cellular production in E. coli for a long time. So we uh, tested our system in the minus alpha B cellular production in E. coli. So we used uh, this metabolite pathway and also the minus alpha B cellular synthase you see here. So we tested, uh, we introduced the two plus like this. This system is basically the, uh, this sgRNA is inhibit the, inhibit the expression of the canamycin gene, the resistant gene. But the, this one is the uh, inhibit the, uh, the sgRNA is the inhibit the GABA gene. So we compare the both system in the, in the production of the minus alpha B cell in engineered E. coli. You can see here when we are using only the antibiotics. The minus alpha B cell production is low, but when we are using the just uh, uh, single antibiotic and the CRISPR based double invert, then the minus alpha B cell production is increased and also the cell growth is increased. So I think that uh, maybe uh, the CRISPR based double invert selection system is more uh, appropriate for the uh, cell growth and the minus alpha B cell production in our study. So uh, basically, this uh, uh, mevalonate pathway based minus alpha sub production plus is well known for the toxic effect in E. coli. So we tested uh, uh, this uh, uh, toxic plus is still maintained by our CRISPR based double inverse system. So we introduced the uh, uh, green fluorescent fluorine gene uh, the, in the downstream of the mevalonate pathway. So we tested this system using the uh, our the landing path plasmid. Uh, this in this case we are targeting the GABA gene using the CRISPR double inverter. So you can see here uh, when we are using the CRISPR based double inverter system, the cell growth is uh, increased compared to only the antibiotic based selection system, and the minus alpha B cell is uh, produced. But in contrast to the, the control system, uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the uh, minus alpha B cell production of plasma is totally toxic to the cell, E. coli cells. So we don't have any uh, minus alpha B cell production is here. But uh, when we are using the CRISPR based cell system, the minus alpha B cell can produce. And also, the uh, minus alpha B cell concentration uh, is. Uh, Related with the uh, progression cell, that means the uh, our CRISPR based double inverter uh, uh, successfully uh, select and maintain the uh, my, uh, this toxic plasmid. And but still, we have to use the, the single antibiotic to maintain the, the uh, landing pad plasmid. So. Uh, we want to combine our uh, the CRISPR double inverter system uh, using the classical the uh, oxytropic E. coli strain. So in this case, we are using the deglutamate de uh, oxytropic E. coli strain. But uh, E. coli deglutamate oxytropic strain is only this uh, WM strain is known uh, so far. So we uh, adopted this E. coli WM uh, strain to uh, combine the, our CRISPR double inverse system. In this case, we don't have to use any kind of the antibiotic. So we uh, uh, 
we introduced this uh, glutamate elastomase to uh, complement uh, this uh, glutamate oxytropy uh, in this uh, E. coli dolium strain. So this landing pad has uh, another uh, leg, a, a leg easy, you can see here. So when we uh, uh, introduced the uh, Lamnos, then the, uh, this uh, system is working. Then we can, you can see here that there is uh, there is a long lag phase. But when we are uh, in the in the absence of the lamnos, uh, the strains can uh, uh, grow uh, uh, normally. So it, this uh, the glutam oxytropy coli is uh, working well with our uh, CRISPR landing system. So we tested this uh, CRISPR double limber with the digotomic or oxytopy E. coli strain. You can see here that this landing pad plasmid, and then we add another uh, the plasmid uh, without any kind of the antibody resistance. And then see, we can select the, uh, this uh, uh, strain with the double uh, has covering the two plasmid. When we transfer the cells uh, serially, then we, you can see here the, uh, at the third time, we almost over 90% of the cells have, uh, have the two plasmid in uh, using, uh, selected by our CRISPR over inverse system in this uh, digortamic host to be colized. So uh, we tested uh, digortamate oxytropic uh, strain uh, to select the, uh, the, the, this toxic mevalonate pathway based the minus alpha bisabol production plasmid. You can see here, uh, we uh, successfully uh, select the, uh, this E. coli strain to put, and also the, uh, we, we can see the increased minus alpha bisabol production. And you can see here the uh, only when we are using uh, only CRISPR based double limber system, the uh, the fluorescent cell as, and also the minus alpha bisabol is increased, and also the antibiotics plus CRISPR based the selection system is show the almost the same result. That means we don't have to use any kind of the uh, antibiotics; just we have to use the CRISPR based the system to uh, select and maintain the multiple plasm in this kind of the oxytropy E. coli strain. But as I mentioned before. Uh, the E. coli WM strain is the only unknown uh, deglutamate oxytropy E. coli, but we want to make a, a general protocol to make a deglutamate ox, uh, oxytropy E. coli strain because we have been using the DH5 alpha strain to produce minus alpha bisabol for a long time, but only the WM strain is the uh, deglutamate oxytropy strain. So uh, we want to try to make a, the just as a uh, general protocol to make uh, the deglutamate oxytropy E. coli. So uh, this uh, E. coli WM strain has two mutations, uh, uh, two mutated genes, the uh, MER I and then the GLTS gene. There are a uh, single point mutation is happened in the MER I, and then uh, two mutations are known for the GLTS. So our strategy is very simple. We just uh, re uh, uh, replaced the, the E. coli chromosomal MER I with the mutated the GLTS. This is single uh, one step, and uh, this one step genome engineering is generated at this uh, kind of the uh, mutated uh, uh, GLTS in the chromosome of E. coli. Then we can successfully make uh, this uh, digotamate oxytropy E. coli DH5 alpha strain. It's based on this uh, one step genome engineering strategy. So we uh, expanded this strategy to make other E. coli strain, BL20 and D3, and then SBH01. This SBH01 is uh, adaptive laboratory evolution strain uh, to grow well on the uh, acetate minimum media. So we tested our uh, uh, one-step genome engineering strategy to make uh, uh, this kind of the three E. coli strain. We uh, can successfully generate the uh, digotamate oxytropy E. coli, uh, up E. coli strains. So we combined our CRISPR double inverter system with uh, this uh, um, E. coli models, uh, E. coli DH5 alpha strain. So 
we serially transfer the cells for 15 days, and then we monitor the uh, plasmid stability, and then also the minus alpha double production using this kind of the uh, toxic uh, plasmid. But this plasmid is can be selected and maintained by our CRISPR uh, the Greenberg system. You can see here the left one is the uh, our. Uh, Deglutamate oxytropin E. coli strain, and then the middle one is the, the water type strain, the uh, right one is the, the WM uh, strain. Uh, we compare the four strains in different uh, antibiotic conditions. You can see here the our the CRISPR based the deglutamate oxytropic strains maintained minus alpha bisabolo stably, but the other strains uh, is um, the minus alpha bisabolo production is. Uh, not uh, production is not maintained well, you can see here. And also we tested in more toxic condition because uh, uh, this uh, MBAK1 is, the MM MBAK1 is well known for the uh, increasing the minus alpha visible production, but this uh, is more toxic in E. coli. So we tested uh, this our uh, system in more toxic condition. You can see here still oh, our system is more stable in more stable than other uh, the systems. And also we tested um, uh, plasmid stability using the single cell analysis. You can see here the our uh, deglutamate oxytropic strain with the uh, CRISPR double inverter maintained uh, all plasmid. A transfer the five times, but you can see here the wild type and then uh, WM strain is to lose the, their uh, plasmid when we transfer the cells for the 15 days. So today uh, I just show you guys that uh, just a simple sincere repression, which interference cascade uh, mimic the uh, natural antibiotic and antibiotic resistance mechanism. And then this system is successfully combined with the classical uh, oxytropic strain. Then we don't have to use any kind of the antibiotic produce the, uh, our uh, targeted molecule or the when we are using the multiple plasmid in engineering carry. So uh, thank you for, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of my crew members and also the front users. Thank you for your attention. Actually, we, test, uh, we tested the full, full different plasmid. But, uh, we, could successfully maintain the full class of E. coli, but they have a uh, whole different uh, replication points. Yeah. I guess I don't understand. Go back to slide 25, I think. I don't understand why just the CRISPR alone doesn't outperform the antibiotics with CRISPR. -I. Doesn't adding the antibiotics have some type of detrimental? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So I don't understand the result of like why it's not better without the antibiotics? Uh, actually, uh, we compare the, uh, the cells, a different uh, state of the cells, because when we are using the antibiotics, the cell is right away the, uh, selected. But when we are using the CRISPR interference, then we have to transfer the cells several times to maintain the, uh, to select the, some, uh, the right uh, cells. So maybe uh, we, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons that this, uh, some <laughs> this reason, I think. And then, and then on slide 29, I'm not sure I understand why your system, the far left one, is more stable than with antibiotics. Was it, they're just different routes of escape that you can, um, you can delete, you can modify your production pathway in the antibiotic selection versus you can't modify your pathway? No, I don't. So why I don't understand why why your system is more stable compared to the, the WM strain? Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, we don't know the double the except the uh, 
Yeah, we, we don't test the WM strain for the uh, minus alpha visible production, but we are no, uh, we, uh, we are well aware of the uh, so DH5, DH5 alpha strain is the best to produce minus alpha visible based on our experience. But we don't know the, uh, the genomic sequence of the WM strain, also the uh, uh, transcriptome or the other proteome uh, uh, compared to the our DH5 alpha strain. So maybe we, if we want to know the region exactly, then we have to compare the whole strain in the multi-omics analysis. Yeah. There's no, I will call this. Thank you, bro. We have 10 minutes, right? <laughs> And my name is Yujin Yang, I'm interested in Korea, and I'm very happy to introduce the remark for young scientists. And first speaker is a Ko, Dr. Ko, Han Hee Ko, and Dr. Ko is from the URUSC in the United States, and he will give talk for engineering Rodos Corridium. Yeah, it's difficult. Colloid <laughs> for immense dilos uh, utilization. Okay, so please. Go. Thank you so much for the introduction, and it's a really great honor for me to have this opportunity to give, present some of my work in front of this world-renowned researchers. So. I'm actually really nervous, even more than my PhD dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will do my presentation. So, um, talking about my PhD dissertation, I majored in engineering of non conventional microalgae for the production of biofuels. And these days, I'm working on the engineering of non conventional yeast strains for the production <laughs> of biofuels or like other biochemicals. So I will start the presentation with some brief research objectives and the goal of the, my research. Uh, actually, this research is a part of a KB project, which stands for the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioprocess Innovation. The goal is to produce biofuels or biochemicals in a very sustainable manner. So in this project, we are trying to use the terrestrial plants biomass as a feedstock to produce these variable goods by using like yeast fermentation after genetic engineering. But as everyone knows, the terrestrial plants hydrolysates not only compose the only like glucose, cellulose, acetates, these kind of carbon sources, but also has many like immunocellulogic inhibitors and also some yeasts are incapable of utilizing some of these like non-conventional carbon sources that my same and research project of this part was to enable the yeast strains to utilize these carbon sources in a better and more efficient ways without the inhibiting effects of these inhibit inhibitors. So first, the Kabi project selected three strains for the Yaroya Lipolitica and Rosprin Toroides and Isachenkia Orientalis uh, all of them are very difficult to pronounce, but these to use in this project. So these non-conventional strains were selected because all of these have very high resistance to the cellulosic inhibitors. They were pretty grow well, and especially these two, Yaroya and Rosporidium, are very origin strains that can accumulate about 60 to 65% of leaf piece under certain conditions. So it's pretty good to produce some based chemicals, and also this is a chenkia has a resistance to low pH, that it's pretty good to produce organic acids. And today, I will only talk about this rhodosporidium toroides. Uh, because it's a uh, non-commercial yeast and not, may not, not be very familiar to everyone, I will give a little bit more information about the strain. So this strain is also called rhodopola toroides, and it was first found in some wood pulp, and it 
naturally has the ability to utilize a wide range of carbon sources. So without any genetic perturbations, it can already consume not only glucose, but xylose, phosphate, or arabinose, glycerol, and so most other carbon sources as well. And although its yeast is accumulating loads of carotenoids, especially beta-carotene and tolan or tolarodine, and so so far, although not very much products have been produced in the strain, um, certain terpenoids, like including like pentacarin or bisabolin and so lift molecules or tar, polyketides, and through HP and this has been produced in the strain. Actually, some of them, most of them were produced in like recent years, this year or last year, or like maybe two years ago. So it's pretty uh, hot strain, but not very much has been published yet. But the pro so the problem is when I'm when you try to do some genetic engineering of those <laughs> protein polyloides, um, not very like well designed like genome models or genome sequence has been ready yet. Uh, but actually, this year, multiple papers about the genome sequencing data or some genomic model has been published, but it's still not very as well established compared to other conventional yeast strains. And also, there's no Autonomous replicating sequences found in the strain yet that it's difficult to use plasm system to do genetic engineering. It has about 64% of high GC content, which is always troublesome to do PCR or like Gibson assembly or whatever. And so very strong non homologous end joining. It makes it difficult to do some Cas9 or some other works. So anyway, it has some very distinct features compared to other model strains such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but also other non-plant conventional strains like Yarovia or Lipomyces or Ischenkia. So it's actually in the different division of the phylum. So I wonder that it has some these kind of different aspects compared to other other East strains. So actually, when I first started uh, engineering this strain, I had some difficulties, especially my background was not East. So I started some development of toolkits and so rational toolkits and also random mutation toolkits. And this is in the poster session. So I will just skip this, but yes, I started with this kind of toolkit development and finally today is uh, my presentation topic about this allos metabolism. And although I said it, this strain can already consume xylose, we <coughs> can actually cultivate this with soil xylose as a carbon source. Compared to the glucose condition, is producing and secreting about tons of arabitol. So when you are cultivating it with about 40 gram per liter of xylose, it secretes about 16 gram per liter of arabitol. And although this did not show very distinct, but if you actually cultivate the Growth profile is a little bit slower in xylose, so we wanted to increase the xylose efficiency. And also, the arabitol secretion was not very often found in the yeast fermentation, so we wanted to know more about the mechanism, the metabolism of these pathways. Uh, first, I started with the expression of those essential genes for xylose metabolism that were found in other species, especially the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, I tried to express the xylose reductase and xylose dehydrogenase, and also the xylokinase, and also the xylose isomer which was found from the other terriers. So um, this actually shows a brief results. When I express the xylose reductase or xylose dehydrogenase, xylose reductase, there was not much difference. Isomers also did not result in much difference. But when I express the dehydrogenase, the cell's growth was even slower. And when I expressed the xylulose kinase, the cell showed much enhanced growth rate. So this is the data. And so this bring it down. This one is the results of expressing the xylulose kinase in RT. And somehow, compared to other engineering, although it, I only expressed one single gene, it showed about two folds increased growth rate compared to the com the parental or the other engineer's traits. And also one of the real thing was that 
Zaros consensual rate was pretty similar, and but the arbitral accumulation, uh, the arbitral secretion actually almost disappeared at all. And instead, the cells started to secrete a little bit amount of xylitol here. So which means there were some very large differences, metabolical difference derived from only this single gene expression. And also but because the secretion of arbitral was disappeared, if we compare all the carbons, including xylose and xylitol arbitral, the strain actually consumed the sugars come much faster compared to the parental strains. Uh, to see more about uh, these results, I knocked out some each gene in the strain, so endogenous xylose glutase or dehydrogenase, xylose kinase and xylose kinase. But because, as expected, when I knocked out these genes, the cell's growth rate became much slower, but when I deleted the xylose kinase, which is usually the normal known pathway for xylose metabolism in most yeast strains, the cell did not show any difference in the growth profile or any other profiles. But instead, when I deleted this libulose kinase, the cell just died, did not, could not grow at all. Uh, I only brought some of the data here. Oh. Here. So as you can see, when I deleted the xylose kinase or libulose kinase, the cell grows exactly the same in the glucose condition. But when I cultivate those cells in the xylose condition, um, the, when we did, when I did the libulose kinase, the cell could not grow at all. And in the case of xylose kinase deletion, the cell did not show any difference. So these show that in those proentoloides, somehow, although the strain has this xylose kinase gene, it is only using this uh, very unique non arbitral pathway for the xylose metabolism when there's only xylose. So that's maybe the reason there was no difference after the deletion of xylose kinase here, but it, the cell just died after the deletion of libral kinase. And maybe by expression of this heterologous xylose kinase, the cell is always suffering from the NAD plus balance, redox balance. So probably it's more using this pathway, which is stronger than this pathway. So resulted in the disappearance of arbitral, but resulted in the secretion of a little bit of xylitol. So we found out that this xylose kinase is somehow very important in RT, as it somehow is not utilizing the gene, a functional gene. And I just looked at some domains or some simple comparison between other xylose kinases to see that somehow this XK does not have the C terminal domain and the gene is not expressed at all under the xylose condition, but somehow it's expressed under the acetate condition. So the result is that the heterologous expression of only this PSX xylose kinase is very beneficial for the xylose utilization in the arteroloides. Um, so we found out that it's by just simple one gene expression, the cells can actually benefit from the benefit in xylose condition. We wanted to see if it actually affects the production of some useful chemicals such as triacetyl acid lactone, which was produced by expression of pyrosynthase under xylose condition. And in feldbatch fermentation, you could actually see about 2.16%, 2 2.16% increase in the power production rate. And when I did the same cultivation in actual real hydrolysate, the cell showed a pretty similar growth profile and the accumulation of different uh, consumption rate when it's consuming the glucose, because the cell always consumes the glucose first and then consumes arrows after the glucose depletion. So it was pretty similar in the initial phase, but after glucose is gone and starting to consume xylos, the cell started to show some differences in the time production rate as well. So actually this the simple method was pretty efficient in the production of useful chemicals in this strain when we are using the xylose or hydrosate as a
carbon sources. Um, and so this was like pretty much of the talks. And now these days, I'm also still engineering the strain to allow the co-consumption rate of glucose and xylos or, or express some LTH or some other mechanisms to regenerate the redox, redox, uh, to balance the redox balances or some other pass, introduce other pathways to allow much faster xylos metal utilization in the strain. It was pretty short, but thank you for listening. And I just thank my PI Dr. Jin and <laughs> uh, Professor Jin and my co-PI Dr. Chris Lau and other Jinlan members for the for the high ups and supports. Thank you so much. Thank you for their great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you very familiar with the other situation? Yes. Glucose and gyros, the uh, co-consumption. Yes. Is it possible? And can you make it in this, in this strain? Oh, actually, I am work right now working on that uh, project. And in Saccharomyces service, or in other strain, our lab members has found some transporters that are capable of co-consuming glucose and gyros at the same time. So I express the transporter and also try also express the those like xylose metabolism pathways in constitute way. And it was uh, just like how say screening. It, it's still at the screening level, but two days yesterday, before I came here, when I saw, I saw like reduction of both glucose and xylose in some of the strains. So I'm actually really looking forward to see the results when I get back. <laughs> so the yeah, transporter engineering is yeah, successful in the, yeah, maybe the yeah, the glucose consumption rate maybe the yeah, decreased and the xylose the consumption rate maybe the yeah, increased but balance the, yeah, the glucose xylose consumption maybe quiet quiet maybe. So what is your strategy to anyway that the yeah, glucose consumption rate is still high and then along with that yeah, the xylose consumption also high. That, uh, is, that is possible. Uh, this situation, I think, I don't think like most of them will be high after engineering, but I will just start from the just co consumption of a small amount and then try to increase the consumption rate uh, after we get those results. Hi, nice talk. I, I'm just curious to know, uh, you knocked out few genes. Do you ever considering like uh, using CRISPR I or CRISPR Cas system in your for DM projects? Actually, CRISPR Cas system has been developed by several, I think, three groups so far. And one of them was uh, Dr. Shimin Jiao's lab. And the deletion of these, deletion of like these genes was actually done by using those CRISPR Cas9 system. But in this system, I had to integrate those Cas9 expressing cassette and also the expressing guide dynamic expressing cassette into the genome. So these strains has like those genes in their like full genome. And also it's not I cannot just keep delete like genes ever forever, but yes, these are like Yes, but at least these were done by those CRISPR Cas9 systems. So I was really interested in um, the previous talk about the voltage integration using the CRISPR Cas9. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Why did you use integration? Uh, yes. So is this is in our, in this strain, plasma not, does not work. And it's not really so, so far, like, all the papers or like, research in this training is based on the genome integration. Okay, thanks again. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm a graduate student from uh, Mason Krukla. So I'm Dr. E. Yeah, but I hope <laughs> in the future. So my advisor, Dr. Kruk, was, was initially invited to this conference. I can hear some. You hear an echo? Yeah. I'm not hearing anything. Maybe your ears are more sensitive than mine. I think something. <gasps> So uh, he was initially invited to this conference, but he cannot make it. So he sent me over here. Very nervous, because I think most of you, I mean, professors, famous professors that I've only seen on the papers. <laughs> and also most of you are posters. So very nervous, very shy to talk with you. But today I'll talk about inducible genome-wide mutagenesis for improvement of PDA production by coli. So, um, Plasmid is a circular uh, double strand DNA that is distinguished from the chromosome DNA. Plasmid has been widely used for DNA vaccine production. Uh, normally, the gene encoding the antigen will be inserted into the plasma vector and then transformed into E. coli for replication. Plasmid is a, a course drive of vaccines. Uh, it costs more than 100,000 dollars to, pro to produce one gram plasma DNA. So, uh, 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 normally, after transforming the plasma into the E. coli, it needs to be purified and extracted before use. To improve the PDN production, the most straightforward way is to improve the plasma copy number. So after you transform a plasma into E. coli, it uses the host replication machinery for replication. Within the original replication, there are so many DNA binding sites that can be used to initiate uh, plasma replication. So different original replication gives different plasma copy number in the cell. People have done a lot of work in order to engineer their plasma itself in order to improve the plasma copy number. So what we want to do is we want to engineer a host so which can uh, improve the copy number no matter whatever plasma you put in to get an increased copy number. So the most commonly used plasma is a pack based plasma. It's commonly used for DNA vaccine pr production. So in order to engineer that E. coli strain, there are so many genes we want to investigate. So there's so many and it's very time consuming to investigate them one by one. I don't think we can finish with another year of my PhD. So in order to solve this issue, we can kind of came up with a different idea, which is called inducible genome-wide mutagenesis. So here's, here is how this method works. So basically, we introduce random mutations in the genome by using our mutagenesis plasma. Uh, I will talk about this plasma later. So after introducing random mutations in genome, we were screening for the good variants using our GLP report plasma. So this plasma will have the part based origin. So in principle, the more copies of the plasma in the cell, you will get a more fluorescence. So we can sort the good, good variants by the uh, fax sorting. So then we can get the good variants with increased plasma copy number. So to introduce, to introduce the random mutations in the genome, we use a mutagenic plasma called ATC-MP6. This plasma was originally developed by the David and Liu group, and then our group made some modifications. So this plasma has uh, six genes on it. All of these genes are related to DNA replication and DNA um, uh, proofreading pathway. So these genes are controlled by our ATC inducible promoter. So after adding the ATC to the system, you can increase the average during replicate during DNA replication. So we can um, use this plasma to introduce random patients in the genome. So uh, to start with, uh, I choose First, we need to choose a strain to work with. Uh, I choose the uh, E. coli K12 strain and E. alpha. It's a uh, modified D12 alpha. So it has been commonly used for cloning and uh, plasma preparation because the genome has been completely sequenced and it's well, it's well annotated as well. So I just transform this plasma into their cell and induce its mutagenic plasma to introduce a random mutation in the genome. So after this um, genesis, 
we need a report plasmid for screening. So an ideal GRP report plasmid should have their PAC origin, because this is normally what we want. And the GRP should be driven by a weak promoter and a weak RBS, because PAC is already a high carbon number plasmid. Uh, if the GRP expression level is saturated within the white type cell, we're not able to see their increased uh, GRP expression for our variants. So in order to construct this uh, GRP report plasmid, uh, I use the SEDA Monclo parse gate. It has uh, 40 different promoters and uh, uh, six RBS to choose the ideal promoters and RBS. I just uh, choose three promoters and three RBS and then do the golden gate to, to get a library of nine, uh, nine different combinations. And from the plate, I choose uh, 20 colonies and the uh, um, and uh, measure the fluorescence using the fluorotometry. So this is the result. From the 20 colonies I picked, I uh, found there are six uh, combinations of the promoters and RPS. So the weakest one is the GS32116 promoter and plus B0032 RPS. So it gives a weak fluorescence uh, within the white type in alpha. So after getting this report plasmid, I transform it into this mutator library and uh, to select the variants I want. So I used the uh, fluorescence activity cell sorting. So we go through total three mini cells from the library and then uh, I pick the 1000 cells um, on the selective plate and then uh, screen, them, uh, screen the 100 clones from their plate. So here is the result I got. So from this 1,100 colonies, I was able to get some variants. As you can clearly see, so this plate represents the uh, white type, and it has a weak fluorescence, while for the variant we get has an increased fluorescence. So after we get these variants, we need to confirm that we did get the increased plasma copy number instead of increased transcription or translation level of GLP. So I did a qPCR to determine the plasma copy number uh, within the white type and the mutant. So for the white type, the cross copy number is around 25, and the variant goes up to 700. So we're, we are very happy and exciting about this result. However, uh, however, when I check the plasma topology, normally for DNA vaccine production, you want the supercoiled plasma monomer for DNA vaccine. When I check the plasmid uh, structure, uh, here is a gel over here. So um, the, the second line represents the uh, plasmid that extracted from the white type in fab alpha, which is the uh, supercoiled plasma monomer. Well, for variant, you can clearly see there are two different bands over here. Um, at first, I thought they are linear or open circular plasmid, but actually they are not if you compare it to the two uh, linear and open circular control over here. So to figure out what these two bands are, I send this um, plasmid to the whole plasmid sequencing. So this is the result uh, for the plasma monomer. It's kind of a uh, 3KB plasma monomer representing there is a single peak over here from the nanopore sequencing. And for the mutant, as you can clearly see, the peak shows up at 6KB and 12KB, representing the plasma dimers and tetmers. So we are going to confuse why we got the plasma monomers instead of plasma monomer. So normally the plasma monomer is a result of the whole Norgers recombination. For the white type AB5 alpha, it's, it has this rock A1 mutation, which will reduce the recombination. However, for the uh, variant I got, it has this gain in function of this rock, rock, rock A. So basically there's only one base pair change uh, during the mutagenesis. Uh, the rock A1 is inverted to the rock A. So we got the whole number of recombination between the plasmid. So that's the reason why I kind of get this much more. So in order to avoid this plasma multimerization, we decided to knock out this rock A gene and redo this whole uh, evolution again. So we successfully used the CRISPR uh, system to knock out the whole rock A and redo this screening again. So we got a new variant. Um, 
team is a result for their newer end, the plasma. So we successfully get the plasma monomer this time after rock ignition. So we, we are so happy about this. So after getting this stream, we want to see whether it can improve whether you can give the increased carbon number for different plasma that we transform in, because we want a uh, platform which can increase whatever plasma we transform in gives you increased carbon number. So we test the three, this, this GFP plasma, these are all reported plasma, it gives the increased uh, carbon number. We test another two YHT ways. This is our uh, plasma used in DNA vaccine. It has the same way promoter used for the many cell expression. So we transform this into our strain. It also gives the increased carbon number as well. We also test another uh, plasmid. It's an AV-based uh, uh, DNA vaccine plasmid. I transform it and then it also gives the increased uh, plasma carbon number. So all these three, three plasma have the park-based origin. So our string was able to give their increased copy number for this. Uh, I also tested another um, different origin, which is um, when is the P15A. Uh, surprisingly, the string was not able to give the increased copy number. Instead, it, it kind of decreased the copy number a little. Uh, and also I tested another one, it's a PSC101. It didn't give any difference between the white type and the mutant. So that's it. So our strain is kind of a park specific um, uh, plasma production strain. But this kind of makes sense to me because when we use the park region based uh, GRP report for screening, if we want to get P50A plasma carbon number increases, we can use P50A origin based uh, uh, plasma for screening instead. But this is not necessary because if you want to, if you want higher carbon number, you can switch your plasma into a different origin instead. Um, so after getting this, uh, this, um, this string, we also tested how many, uh, how many PDN we can get from the cell. So we did the uh, whole world DNA extraction and sent the all the DNA, so including the plasma DNA and the germ DNA uh, to the tip, tip station. So that it can analyze how many percent plasma you got uh, in the cell and how many percent gene you have in the cell. So if you look at the web tab, Basically, for the white type plasma, it's um it's around twenty four percent. So that means within the cell, you have twenty four percent plasma DNA. Well, if you look at the mutant we get, there's a clear um, higher peak compared to the white type. So the percentage of the plasma increased to fifty. So that means more than fifty uh more than fifty DNA in the cell. There more than fifty plasma. DNA with so that's it. Uh, so next we characterize the characterize the performance of the wild type and the very end in a one liter bio reactor. We want to test whether we can use this uh, uh, for the fermentation. So here's the growth and also the vermetric yield and the specific yield for the both the wild type and the mutant. You can see that the mutant grow a little bit slower compared to the white type. But that makes sense because uh, if, if you have more plasma in the cell, you have more metabolic burden. You kind of, yeah, it's heavy to grow, so it's a slower. And uh, regarding the volumetric yield, it's kind of a 1.25 fold increases uh, compared to the white type. And we get a 1.3 fold increase for the specific yield. So after getting this very end and the current type's performance, <coughs> next thing I want to do is I want to see what's the mutation in the genome. So what the mutation give this performance, this uh, increased uh, performance in the genome. However, when I uh, analyzed the uh, six result, I was kind of shocked. There are 87 mutations in the genome. Uh, I was got so upset. I mean, with so many mutations, how can I figure it out? I tried a few things. I tried to induce uh, the mutagen's plasma with shorter time, because with short time, there are, there are less cell doubling cycles. You would expect a less mutation in genome. However, I was not able to get the very end from the sorting. And also, I, I tried to compare a second result between uh, this good variant with other, um, other strains, strains, which doesn't give their uh, increased copy number to figure out which mutation might not be important. But it also didn't work out because, you know, the 
genome is very uh, large and the mutation is kind of so random in the uh, places. So it turns out that it's kind of really hard to get a burden with increased problem for that. So currently I have no idea which mutation is important. So Nathan was asking me to come to this conference to ask some, <laughs> some more suggestions. Uh, yes. Uh, of course, the only and I mean the only thing I can do right now is I can look up all the mutations and um, you know all the functions of each gene, and uh, you know trying to come up or category. I mean these genes are related to metabolic flux. These genes are related to DNA replication. These are related to DNA uh, plasma quality or stability. I mean, for us, I would rather. I mean, if you can. And here's what, how to deal with this. I would like to do some powerful sessions. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank my uh, advisor, Dr. Crook, and also the other group members, and also my underage Gina for the help. I also want to thank the, my funding source as well. I also want to thank you all for the listening and all organizers for the invitation. Thank you so much. And do you have any comments? I have an idea. How to yes. Invitation. <laughs> so, are those all in the operating frame or not in? You no. Know, I mean, have you looked into that? Yeah, I look at those. So, not all of them are in the operating from someone, but in the, um, what is that? Intergenic, Intergenic. regions. I think this, those are in the intergenic region are not important. Yeah, but there's but the to, uh, I mean, we can hypothesize maybe this is a gain of function mutation or loss of function mutation. But for the loss of function mutation, we have a, a KO collection. We have E. coli strain has individual gene knockout. So maybe if you have those 87, it has the operating frame, then you can order. But well, somebody has maybe an NC state, you can get those 87 knockout, individually knockout mutant, then you can transform your plasmid, and you may want to see which plasmid has a higher copy number or something. But, but this is still a very naive approach because uh, maybe it is uh, not by the one mutation, maybe you know, this uh, came from the combined effect of multiple mutation, but at least uh, you can use those available knockout collection for initial investigation. Uh, yes. So. Uh, basically, this mutagenesis pattern may mainly introduce subscriptions instead of uh, deletion or insertion. So there are some mutations have the introduced a stop code. I think this is kind of similar to the knockout. I can definitely test those. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I wonder when you causing those mutations, did you design your plan form in a way it's only causing mutation in the genomic DNA, not causing mutation in the plasma DNA? Uh, yes, so this uh, pl mutagenic plasma is an inducible plasma. So uh, after I induce it, create a mutation in the genome, uh, and then I transform the plasma in without the induction. So in principle, the mutation rate in the plasma is no. And also after I got the string, I double check there's no mutation introduced in the plasma to make sure so the chance is lower, right? Because yeah, yes. the plasma is small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is still a possibility. Is there any? Do we have time for one? So, so in any E. coli, depending on the, the, the growth phase, you can have different copies of your genome. So, which which point in your growth phase did you look at this in terms of looking at the ratio of the plasma DNA versus the genomic DNA? Oh yes. So. Uh, Yes, the plasma copy number differs, uh, if it's different from different uh, growth phase. Uh, I, um, I tested the plasma copy number at the registration phase, yes. Okay. And then just as technoeconomic wise, is, it, is the cost for the purification more about the, the titer or is it more about the ratio of the plasmid versus genomic DNA? I think for the uh, purpose of this project, we are more curious about the improved the plasma copy number. But uh, for the industry, I think we are more curious about the tickers. But since there's no uh, fermentation optimization for this project, I think after they, if we want to seal the strain, they need to do more 
from tension optimization for this strange. Thank you again. And let's move to the next speaker. The next speaker is Daniel Lee. Uh, he worked in Tibet State and trailed with for a natural lockdown production in Shudomunash Kida, DBTA cycle for PKS based environmental markets. Okay, to record. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Lee, and I have been working as postdoc in Jane Kistling Lab for two years. It is my great honor to be here, and I appreciate for giving me this opportunity. So, my main project in Jane Kistling Lab is about PKS based retrovirus synthesis. So, Professor Jane Kistling already gave us a great introduction about synthase and my project. So, I just I'd like to tell you like a little bit more detail. So I'd like to emphasize the modularity of polyketide synthase one more time. So polyketide synthase is like a highly modularized. So there is a loading module and there is an extension module and there is termination module. So by reprogramming or reconfigurating the order of modules and domain synthesis enzyme, we can theoretically produce like billions of different new to nature products. So I have always thought this polyketide synthase is the most suitable enzyme for synthetic biology approach. So for example, for the loading module, you can choose loading module to incorporate on the starter unit. And you can choose extension module to incorporate on this quality criteria, which is as an extender unit. Uh, especially AT domain in the extension module determine the specificity to each molecular equator reduce. And there is additional domains in the extension module. So by adding or removing those domain, we can control the reduction level of extending backbone. And lastly, we can determine the termination module. Sometimes we can just release the extended backbone as an asset form, but sometimes we can cyclize it into the ring structure. So please imagine the combination of these options. So we can produce like a millions of different compounds. And even this is a single extension module system. You can use multiple extension module system to expand design space of this PKS based production. So my main project in Kisling Lab is about establishing this hydrocook and automated PKS based retrovirus synthesis PKS cycle. So first, theoretically, you can choose whatever compound you want and we design polyketide synthase for producing this compound. We design the population of modules and domains to produce this compound. And of course, we need to build PKS DNA, and we need to build the strain uh, by introducing those PKS DNA into our host. And of course, after the strain construction, we need test step. We usually do proteomic analysis and metabolomic analysis. And by integrating this module data, we can learn something to improve our titer or improve our PKS design. Then we can repeat this cycle. So for the design step in JBay, we already have a great tools for designing polyketide synthesis with cluster CAD. So input for the cluster CAD is a structure of your target compound. Based on this structure, a cluster CAD suggests you the configuration of modules and domains of polyketide synthase. Usually it provides like a many different options. So we usually design hundreds of different polyketide synthase for our target compound. So after the design, we need to build polyketide synthase DNA. Usually polyketide synthase is a huge enzyme. Even with a single extension module, uh, the gene size is more than eight to nine kilobytes per So we need some DNA assembly. So we established this hydrocode and automated DNA assembly pipeline. So now success ratio of this pipeline is around 70 to 80%. And now constructing hundreds of different polyketide synthase DNA takes less than three weeks, including the time for the sequence verification by using next generation sequencing. So success ratio means if you design hundreds of different polyketide synthase DNA, you will get 70 or 80 fully assembled and clean polyketide synthase DNA in less than three weeks. And also we automated the strain construction pipeline. So now constructing hundreds of different strains takes only less than 10 weeks. Pipeline including the include the 
fiber preparing samples for tests that like from pandemic and double analysis. And for test and low step, we have a fantastic collaborator. We have an outstanding proteomics team in Geneva, and we have a collaborator in PNNL for metabolic analysis, and we have a long team in Argonne National Lab. So with test and loan step, we can identify the bottleneck of this PKS-based production, or sometimes we can get a hint to improve our PKS design. So our first target using this db cycle was bladder lactam. Is a monomer of nylon 5. And nylon 5 is known to have a higher thermal stability than that normal commercial nylon, nylon 6. And also recently, better electric feature of this nylon 5 has been reported, which means we might be able to use this nylon 5 in the manufacturing of semiconductor. So it is quite promising polymer. But this bladder lactam and capro lactam, uh, there is a well known biosynthetic pathway for these two compounds. And why do we need to produce them using polyketide synthase? Because we want to produce lateral derivatives, not lateral lactam. In case of the caproractam, it is well known that if we add additional residue on the IPAC carbon of the caproractam, the, the feature of the finer polymer will be changed. For example, if we add aryl residue on here, the finer polymer, the finer, finer nylon 6, is much stronger than normal nylon 6. And if we add angel residue on here, the finer polymer is fire resistant. We believe same story will happen to the lactam and these derivatives. But please imagine producing those lactam derivatives using conventional metabolic engineering. We might need to design whole new biosynthetic pathway, or we might need a, lo a lot of protein engineering. But with polyketide synthase, we can just exchange the domain or module which is in charge of this alpha carbon and we can add additional residue, what we want. So, yeah, so that's, that's why we uh, chose this valerial lactam derivatives as a first target by pro, pro, like, uh, producing these by polyketide synthase. And we chose a uh, host for this lactam production first. We chose Pseudomonas petida because it is favorite species of JB. And it has a versatile metabolism, so it can utilize cheap and renewable carbon source to produce valuable product. But sometimes its versatile metabolism is not good. Uh, sometimes it catabolizes our target compound. So we knock out several genes involved in the, the catabolism of bladder lactam and caprolactam. And also, Pseudomonas petita produced a little bit amount of bladder lactam native. So we knock out several genes in so now we have a good pseudomonas petita, which does not eat and which does not produce our target compound. And for easy of the genetic manipulation, we introduced these nine uh, distinct landing pads into the pseudomonas petita genome. So these landing pads allow us to integrate nine different plasmids into the nine distinct loci in the genome very fastly and very easily. So it's time to design the pathway for the bladder lactam and its derivative production. So we designed this pathway based on the biosynthetic pathway, which is a polyketide. It starts from the aspartate, and after several modifications, beta alanin moiety is loaded onto the loading module of polyketide synthase. And we can extend this starter unit by using this extension module. And we can use one of the malonic way derivatives as an extender unit. And finally, we can cyclize this extended backbone using termination domain to the lactam structure. So to confirm this design, we purified all the enzymes involved in the, this beta amino acid loading part and also loading module of polyketide synthase. Uh, to make a long story short, in vitro assay confirmed that all step worked as we expected. We was able to start from the aspartate and then we was able to load so it's time to design extension module of polyketide synthase. This is the PKS for glucosin biosynthesis. So we want to use beta alanine moiety as a starter unit. So we need to use this loading module and we want to cyclize it into the lactam. So we need to use this termination domain. So two things were fixed, but we try to design our polyketide synthase as natural as possible. 
So there was only two options, using the first module or using the last module. Both module contained uh, like four domains, so it was appropriate for the lockdown production. However, both of them used ethyl malonic coil as an extender unit, not malonic coil. So our final product will be the ethyl malonic. So we chose this product as a, our first target. And so to like express all the like genes in our host, we designed like many different versions of this beta amino acid loading pair. And also we designed several different versions of the chimeric PKS. As I mentioned, there was a two design using the first module and using the last module. But for the, this, like, uh, this polyketide synthase, as I mentioned, it is huge gene and it is usually, usually origin, originated from the streptomyces. So GC content is quite high. So for the proper expression of these PKS in our host, uh, we thought that maybe codon optimization is really important. I was not a big fan of the codon optimization, but in this case, yeah, we tested like three different <coughs> codon optimization methods. And we need one more thing for the ethyl volatile lactam. Uh, Pseudomonospitida cannot produce this ethyl malonic <coughs> unit. So we introduced one more enzyme to convert crotonic coa into ethyl malonic coa. So after combination of this part, uh, we successfully produced ethyl volatile lactam. Most of the combination produced ethyl volatile lactam. And the title was highly correlated with the PKS expression level. And as you can see on here, there was a two different design and three different code optimization method. This MCU method was the best for the PKS expression in Sudomonas Petita. This is like a abbreviation of edge code. So again, <coughs> yeah, in case of the polyketide synthase, we think code optimization. Now we have a functional system and functional PKS for ethyl volatile lactam production. So it is now time to enjoy the modularity of polyketide synthase. We can just exchange this AT domain to another AT domain using another malonic coil derivatives. Then we can easily produce volatile lactam derivatives. So we designed this kind of the AT domain swap polyketide synthase and these eight derivatives for our target. And of course, we need some additional genetic engineering to produce those unique extender unit. But it was not easy. <laughs> so, for example, so these are the like a functional PKS for ethyl bilateral lactam. So, if we swap in, if we swap this AT domain with the AT domain from the picromycin module seven, which utilizes methyl malonic way as an extender unit, we can produce methyl bilateral. So to make a long story short, we have successfully produced these six lateral lactam derivatives. And we are now polymerizing these compounds into the new to nature nylon plot. We are now trying to test the feature of those new polymers. And we have tested long step. So I, we chose lateral lactam as the case. So throughout the engineering step for the lateral lactam production, we performed proteomic and metabolic the lesson from this multi-omics analysis was our strain based the nitrogen limited condition. Especially the amino acid was not enough in the media for this strain to translate these huge enzymes and many enzymes. So we supplied the little bit of the amino acid mixture in the media and it improved tighter a lot. So I think this is a good example of using the test and learn step to improve the tighter. <laughs> Lastly, I, I'd like to highlight the benefit of this PKS-based microbial production. So, of course, we are using Pseudomonas Petiza, which utilizes cheap and renewable carbon source. So, it was able to produce these lateral lactam derivatives from the sorghum hydrolyzed, the biomass. And also, all the textile you touch in the real life is made by the enantiomolecularly pure <laughs> For our these lateral lactam derivatives, they have one chiral center here. So it can be like R type and it can be S type. But if you make a polymer with the mixture of this R and S type, the racemic mixture, you cannot get a bomb filling. So it is important to get an enantiomorically pure compound. But PKS based production, by depending, depending which type of the domain you are going to use, which domain you are going to use, 
you can control the stereotype of the final compound. So this gray, uh, gray line indicates the isobutyl level lactam produced by chemical synthesis. You cannot control the stereotypes. So there is a R type and there is a S type. But our like uh, isobutyl lactam from our stream only shows single here. So it means it is enantiomerically pure and it, it is good to be. So in summary, we have established this hydro good and automated <coughs> cycle for BKS based retrobiosynthesis. And now the single round of this cycle takes less than two months. And we hope to use this cycle to produce another value of commodity chemicals now. I appreciate uh, Mr. Kisling for having me this course around BKS engineering. And so thanks to other lab members and collaborator in Thank you for your attention. Uh, is there any specific reason to select the uh, monos to the diet of the string? You mentioned that the phosphorus metabolism is very uh, good for. Right, I, I, am, I understand that. But yeah. what, what is it? Any, any other uh, reason? Oh, actually, uh, we usually use E. coli as a host for the PKS expression, but Pseudomonas petita has a little bit better metabolic capacity than E. coli for producing those unique extended units. And also Pseudomonas petita have this native enzyme which can activate the PKS. So for the E. coli, we need to introduce that additional enzyme to activate polyketide synthase. But in case of the Pseudomonas petita, it already have it and it works really well. That's why we chose this so the maintenance of the, the, the level of the, the extend unit is very important to the make the product. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, Shudomonas is quite well known for the degradation of complicated uh, molecules, right? Yeah. So if your target molecule is degraded by the your host, then it's a quite mm -hmm. big problem. So yeah. what do you think about that? Actually, actually that's a good question. So for that one, we use RBT and C technique. So we usually, we have a target compound. And we use that as a carbon source for growing the pseudomonas petita. <laughs> and we can find out which genes are involved in the catabolism of that compound. In that case, we can just knock out those genes to pseudomonas petita and cannot eat them. Mm -hmm. That's what we did for the lockdown as well. Is there a specific enzyme for cyclation of the, your target protein? Uh, in, uh, in our case, our like, termination domain of polyketide synthase can cyclize it into the last time. That's why we chose this domain. That's yes, yes. yeah. There are many. Can I see the previous? Oh, yeah. This termination domain cyclizes the extended backbone into the lactam and release it from the Thank you for introducing me. Uh, this is my first international speech, so please uh, excuse my poor, poor language level. <laughs> I have a duty for a fast ending, so I will do, do it. <laughs> Uh, today, I'm going to show you my, oh, sorry. Okay. my perspective on synthetic biology and as a, as a structural biologist, and also some of our recent advances in that field. Um, so everybody knows that the matter is composed of elementary particles, atoms, and molecules, uh, but I wondered how many uh, kinds of molecules exist in the universe and where they come from? Uh, it was a big question to me. So uh, 
I searched on the internet and found that there are, there are 200 of ki kinds of molecules detected out there. So this is my hypothesis. Uh, the, the majority of molecule kinds is located in a tiny space of the Earth. So uh, to my knowledge, it's obvious that life is the main driver of molecular diversity on Earth. Uh, and in, in other words, uh, biology means uh, the ruler of the chemical land. So uh, what should we do now with synthetic biology? Uh, we usually may modify genes, but in the central dogma, DNA, RNA, and proteins, uh, there are missing parts, structure, and function. Uh, our target is function, but we only have a lot of sequence information. So the main bottleneck of our, our knowledge is sequence function relationship. Uh, this is my viewpoint of, of biology. And uh, mean, mean, meanwhile, our laboratory has worked a lot, but uh, PET biodegradation and PETAs, uh, the main goal is uh, to find the most efficient enzyme template for engineering. So I, I tried to find enzyme with, uh, using the uh, natural sequence information in that view, because uh, I'm a student of the of nature. Uh, so the, basically, uh, my approach is based on the uh, assumption uh, that is a close relationship between the function and sequence homology. So there are three uh, non-methods to see if the sequences by homology or a sequence pattern. Uh, so I, at first, I built a, a PTAS candidate library of 2,064 sequences and, and built a phylogenetic tree. It was uh, very elusive and uh, hard to uh, obtain uh, valuable in information on that point. So uh, then I performed the SSN analysis. It was also not useful because there is no pattern of uh, uh, protein groups in the literature. So uh, I decided to make our own algorithms to uh, cluster, cluster these sequences into uh, human recognizable groups. Uh, so I, I made a heuristic algorithm, and this is uh, uh, the re here's the result of, of our algorithms. Uh, there are three non uh, uh, well known uh, uh, PTAs categories, such as uh, summer bifida kinases and type two B and LCC group. Our algorithms uh, reproduce these sequences, these categories. Uh, from 2,000 sequence at once. Uh, and next, I, I applied a uh, sampling method to reduce the, the number of uh, screening tests among the clusters. Uh, totally, we, we uh, uh, 347 sequences were tested uh, using their recombinant proteins. As you see here, uh, the second cluster sampling gave us much much better result than the previous one. Uh, so the most pot uh, more importantly, our uh, approach gave us uh, three potent groups that have highly uh, uh, talented uh, PTH candidates: H thirteen nineteen and H fifteen oh one. These are having both properties of high speed and high durability. So uh, using our uh, national engineering know-hows and the, the library sequence information, we developed much more efficient uh, returns from these uh, uh, PETAs candidates very quickly. So uh, finally, we <coughs> achieved the uh, uh, industrial performance of PTAs and our uh, enzyme is two times faster than the uh, LCC mutant previously known the best enzyme. 
So this is our, uh, uh, this is applications of our enzyme. Uh, so uh, pulling it disappears within a few hours and we can remake the closed and highly mixed polyesters into monomers at uh, ambient and uh, ambient to medium temperatures. So I'm currently making, uh, uh, creating a, a web server of this protein database. And the next plan is a targeting on metabolic engineering. Uh, our algorithm is fully automatic and takes a few, uh, few seconds or thousands of sequences. So uh, it will reduce the cost for unknown sequence identification. Uh, so uh, I hope that biotechnology with this uh, semi-automatic approach uh, make, soon make this factory screen. Thanks to my, uh, thanks to Professor Nanjin Kim, our lab members, and thanks to uh, the professors and PhDs uh, inspiring, inspiring me. And thank you for attention. Any question and comment? So the, what, what is the main product of your factories? The DHE2, the MHE2, the terapeutic acid? So the, you don't need any you know, more enzymes to be a degree to be a BHE2, MHE2, the terapeutic acid. Yes. Just pet it in. Yes, yes. yes. Actually, the BHE2 is a very important chemical to produce synthesized in the field. Why did why do you select your CPA as a final product? Because uh, the the water is the solvent. Because because the water is solvent, the main product is produced just as a uh acid. So uh, that's why I I produced TPA. I had just a very quick question. Um, when you showed the bioreactors with the different shirts that were all of different colors, were, so were the shirts made of polyethylene terephthalate? Yes. Okay. Is, is that common? Because I, I know, you know, a lot of clothing is nylon, or I thought it was, I, I didn't know that PET uh, would be in clothes. Uh, yes, my, the, the main, main component of the clothes is polyester. But PET polyester. And those are actually clothes that you can buy commercially, not that you made just for the product. I'm just a commercial product. Okay. That's really neat. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sungu Lee. Uh, I'm leading the uh, Synthetic Biology Institute, and uh, it's my honor to chair this morning session. We are going to have two uh, speakers uh, in this first session. The speaker is Professor Lee Ho, who's working in Korea University, uh, but he has been the uh, director of uh, <coughs> science in the National Research Foundation to the uh, last August. He will talk about the uh, uh, Korean policy for sensei biology. And please welcome his uh, host. For the introduction, uh, uh, I served as a uh, program director in National Research Foundation until August, so that's why I, I will produce uh, about the, the uh, policy. And actually, uh, it was last year we had a meeting, first workshop on December. Year. And at that time, 
we just announced the synthetic biology initiative in Korean government. Actually, it was prepared more than two years, and Korean government finally announced the synthetic biology initiative at that time. And then I introduced that uh, initiative uh, in that workshop. And then for last one year, we had made uh, some progress and some not. And I want to update uh, those things uh, in this session. Okay, at the time, we announced three st strategies for boosting synthetic biology in Korea. And the goal is we want to transform 30% of uh, uh, all the, the, the uh, chemical synthesis to biotransformation. And then the other goal is we want to achieve 90% of global uh, best technology of synthetic biology by 2030. The 30% and 90% that, how can we calculate those? Or that, that's not the important issue, I think. Uh, the issue is we want to uh, move on and we want to have, we, we, we have to achieve some great things during that time. That is uh, some uh, message from Korean government. So, to achieve these goals, we made the three strategies. First is about the research and technology. And uh, I want to, one by one, so uh, I want to update on this issue, what happened in the uh, research and technology development part. We have two issues here. One is uh, increasing R&D funding for the synthetic biology in Korea. And second one is promoting strategic field and the roadmap uh, in synthetic biology. And uh, that, uh, that was introduced here, a uh, roadmap and then collaboration R&D fund uh, was proposed at that time. Uh, the first one, we just announced the uh, roadmap for the synthetic biology of Korea. And uh, here, the similar uh, wording is here. We want to, the goal is we want to make industrially applicable artificial cells by 2030. Those artificial cells for, uh, is, are for the new drug development for high value material production and so on. And so that's uh, our goal. And these the are uh, how we can achieve those uh, in different uh, parts of uh, technologies. So you are explained here. It's a little bit messy to, for you to follow. So this is better to, um, to see. So this is six uh, technologies we have to achieve to, to, to accomplish those goals uh, that can be divided into three different classes. One is design and second one is construction and editing of artificial cells. And then third one is creating values based on that. <laughs> okay, the first one uh, we <laughs> divide into two parts. One is uh, design of uh, biomolecule. We have a great uh, enhanced uh, technology like uh, alpha port and so on. Uh, so we want to, we want to uh, utilize those technology and we want to design biomolecule based on those. And then the second one is uh, the bio system is not just the sum of the biomolecules. So we have to design the circuit, and genetic circuit or metabolic pathway circuit and so on. Those are design issues we, we have to achieve. Second uh, class is uh, we have to construct based on the design. So. Uh, constructing DNA, RNA is especially important for making artificial cells. And, and then the fourth one is constructing biosystem. Uh, really, uh, it, it contains cell free system and uh, various artificial cells. We want to achieve microbial artificial cell until 2030 and artificial plant and animal cell until 2035. That's, the, that's our course. And then the third class of uh, technology is making value out of, our, out of this. Uh, that contains automation and speed up using uh, digital technology. 
and then uh, the scale of issue uh, in bioprocess. So uh, this uh, six core technology was were announced just two days before we would be traveled here. And then uh, uh, based on those, we uh, selected nine leading projects to be utilized in various industry and to overcome the limitation of current technology. And those are uh, uh, belong to three categories. One is cell bio. So we want to make a novel candidate molecules for therapeutics in three different areas. One is small molecule, second one is uh, antibody and cell therapy, and the third one is mRNA and gene therapy issues. The second category is securing our environment, uh, like uh, solving the CO2 issues or plastic issues or uh, some ecological issues like uh, pesticide or virus or bacteria problems. And the third category is about the value-added material using synthetic biology that contains uh, alternative foods <laughs> and in vitro uh, pest uh, synthesis system and then plant-based cell factories. So which are the three uh, uh, projects we want to pursue. So these are nine leading projects we selected and pursue for next few years in synthetic biology area. And you can recognize some of these uh, faces in, in this announcement. That happened very recently. And then the other one is making, uh, fostering the R&D funding in synthetic biology field. Uh, that is, I, I cannot prepare the slide because it's not officialized yet. And uh, it, the, the budget should be passed the Congress uh, to be officialized. That, have, that will be happened in this December, but it's almost uh, clear to, to, to be passed. And there, had, there will be about uh, almost 20 projects uh, will be pursued. And then in addition to that, uh, we will start a few uh, projects between US and Korea collaboration in next, in, in middle of next year. So what will be happen to fostering this uh, synthetic biology R&D? Uh, we all have to um, prepare those and then we have to make some good uh, result, good outcome out of those. Okay, so that those are the first uh, strategic plan we made. Second one is making infrastructure for synthetic biology, that is K-Bio Foundry. Uh, we planned uh, to have a celebration party here in this workshop <laughs> for the success of this uh, uh, program, but uh, we couldn't. Uh, uh, the the uh, Ministry of Science and then the agency who evaluates this project, they uh, decide to extend the evaluation until the end of this December. So the official, official result will be announced early next year. So uh, we hope we can get the funding for the K-Bio Foundry. So I want to briefly uh, explain what happened during that time. So we have, we need DBTR uh, infrastructure. This DBTR is different from the DBTR in our research or laboratory. It is for the Bio Foundry, so we need really uh, good facility for uh, design and build and test and running itself. So uh, some AI driven or we have to manage the big data and so on. And we need really good hands for the, uh, the digital building facility and test facility. Using those uh, public uh, static biology, we will this is the objectives. We will improve the speed and, and, and so on. So uh, 
for those, uh, the location is the same. Uh, as we planned, it is located, it will be located between uh, Crip and Kaisi in Daejeon. So still uh, this plan is uh, still solid. And then uh, they, the, the evaluation agency, they really uh, pushed hard on this IT issue. Do you have IT people? Do you have, do you know how much about the, the, uh, this uh, IT platform and so on? So we prepared a uh, little bit about this. Uh, we are gonna use uh, a lot of uh, this uh, management uh, system, uh, including laboratory management system and data analysis system and so on. And also we uh, prepare several level, hierarchical level uh, data management system, uh, language database, and then we learn what kind of synthetic biology tools are available and so on. And using these, uh, collecting these uh, uh, programs, we have to develop our own software and then we have to utilize those <coughs> IT platforms. So in, in CRIP, uh, by, uh, led by uh, Dr. Sung Lee, uh, they uh, develop, they are starting developing some software like uh, Oliver Engine and then uh, engagement management uh, system and so on. So we, we start to hand on uh, development on this IT system. Also, uh, the evaluation agents asked us what kind of plan on this, that facility and so we had to prepare this. We we are preparing 39 workflow. What is workflow? Uh, yesterday we talked about this but workflow is uh, some kind of task um, we, uh, we will perform in the biofoundry and we proposed uh, 38 workflows like this and then they want to want us to provide some example how this works. So uh, we make a workflow network like this, it's design, build, test, and run. And then uh, using some of these, we can make this kind of task. And then uh, in each workflow, there will be some unit process, something like that. We have to, uh, we had to prepare all of these and then uh, explain the evaluation agencies. And we made one example on how workflow will operate after this K Bio Foundry is built. It is one example with enzyme engineering. It, this uh, task will use these 12 workflows. And then these 12 workflows can be summarized like this. And then uh, each workflow has uh, one or three or four uh, unit processes. And they ask us to. Uh, provide what what will be the input and what will be the output of this uh, workflow. So we have to uh, summarize those uh, material input and material output and so on. What we have done so <clears throat> so far, and then we have to uh, show them in in this image uh, how workflow uh, can be operate and, and so on. So. That kind of evaluation is still going on, and hopefully this can be done in this potentially this December. And then this is the, the K Bio Boundary Beta, which is operated by uh, Dr. Tsunguri uh, and his colleagues in CRIP. And then uh, uh, they they are very busy to prepare that evaluation and as well as these facilities. And so uh, they made uh, some some part of this work. They built some part of this workflow, and then I tried to demonstrate those in these facilities. Okay, and then another thing uh, they asked, and then we have to decide it was what is the uh, main purpose of this uh, the public K Bio Foundry, and we. We answered like uh, we will accelerate biomanufacturing uh, innovation in Korea. <laughs> so uh, how can you do that? Can you do that by one uh, 
uh, biofoundry in Korea and so on. And we, to answer those questions, uh, we made uh, this kind of plan. Uh, we first built a uh, uh, national public biofoundry in Daejeon. And then we, accumulate, uh, we acquired uh, technologies and manpower and so on in this biofoundry. And then later on, maybe from 28, we will build a local and regional a small, uh, less, uh, smaller uh, biofoundry in different areas. That, that's how we will boost the synthetic biology in all the country. So that's another um, plan we proposed for this program. Okay, that's what, have, is, what is going on in the second uh, strategic plan. And then third strategy plan is about the ecosystem uh, in our academia and other society. We proposed uh, uh, domestic and international collaboration, and then uh, we make some other infra for the synthetic biology and promotion. And this one is uh, internal and the domestic and uh, international collaboration. So we uh, made the KSBA, Korean Synthetic Biology Association, uh, in last year, July last year. Uh, uh, special thing in this association is usually this kind of uh, uh, association uh, for the technology, uh, government doesn't participate in. But in this uh, association, uh, government uh, government office officer uh, will participate in as a member so that's the, the how they uh, how much they serious about this technology okay and that was started in last year but no money until this year so we established a uh, ksba uh, official uh, bigger uh, association this year and then from next year we can get money from the government and then we'll finally we can operate in and then we will open the home page and then and so on so all of you should uh, enroll as, as a member in this uh, CSBA. that's what happened in, in korean side and then for the international collaboration this is the picture of uh, our workshop in last year, and probably we need a uh, picture for this uh, workshop as well. And then next year we plan to have another workshop in, in Korea, either Asian or Jeju Island, whatever. Jeju <laughs> <laughs> is on the list. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, another collaboration is made in uh, about the. Global Biofoundry Association that will be held in Korea as well in the next year, and so on. So uh, a few multiple collaboration are going on in this uh, area. Also, uh, the legal issue. Uh, we make an uh, act on the promo promoting synthetic <laughs> biology. It was proposed in the Congress in last uh, September and in, in something is going on in the in the Congress. Hopefully, it can be passed uh, late this year or early next year. Also, to uh, support to get the support from social society, our society, we have we had two uh, technology social impact assessments, one by KSTEP one agency about synthetic biology technology. And this year we have another assessment with STEPI about biofoundry technology. So that's something we are working on for the uh, society awareness. Um, meanwhile, uh, there is another uh, <clears throat> bigger issue that's gone, has gone, has achieved. This is about 20 national, 12, national strategic technology that was selected in last uh, October. Uh, the 12 
uh, include semiconductor. I sorry about the Korean. I, I didn't have time to translate this word. <laughs> okay, this is semiconductor and display and battery and then mobility and nuclear power, AI and robotics and then quantum computing and then communication next generation communication and then uh, cybernetic security hydrogen production and cyber space technology and then this is the cutting edge biotechnology and then this one is selected by government in last october and then uh, the special act on support and promoting these 12 technology were the, the law was passed in March. Uh, so this the support for this 12 technology will be will be will, will stay and then will, will be increasing for next few years. And uh, there are four different uh, issues in this cutting edge biotechnology and the major one is synthetic biology. So uh, that's something happened and then uh, the law should have uh, this decree to be enforced. And then the decree was passed in last September. And so it, it become enforced. And then and then the roadmap for cutting edge biotechnology was uh, announced one day before we traveled here, which is this one. So uh, the right hand, left hand side is the current status of cutting edge biotechnology in Korea and left hand side is about how what we have to achieve in the next few years and so on. Those are the something happened to support synthetic biology in our government. And then for the uh, training talented synthetic biology specialist, uh, the KAIST opened the engineering biology graduate school from the fourth semester of 2023. Celebration. Uh, so we we have we prepared to to make a graduate student to, can support the synthetic biology and bioboundary technology. Okay, those are the some ecosystem we are uh, achieved for last uh, years, and then we still have many issues to solve. Something like a patent. There is no no preparation for the patent issue in synthetic biology and LMO issue and so on. So still some some part we have to work on to realize this synthetic biology technology in industry. Okay, so uh, to do all of this, uh, we need to realize that next time more and more. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Jeff. Are you are there? Yeah. I'm here. So he'll talk about um, digital uh, DNA digital data storage system, right? So can you open uh, your presentations? Yep. yep. And Jeff, are you okay if we record this? Uh, yeah, all good. So you are saying good, so you can go. Looks good, okay, great. All right, uh, <clears throat> nice to uh, see everyone uh, here. Sorry I couldn't join in person due to some uh, other uh, travel conflicts, but I appreciate the invitation and excited to talk to you all uh, about our work uh, combining uh, molecular information storage, specifically DNA-based uh, digital data storage together with uh, Cas9 and deep learning for highly parallel information uh, extraction. <clears throat> um, okay. So, <clears throat> so my group at the University of Washington, we're in the uh, Computer Allen School of Computer Science. And so my research is sort of broadly uh, uh, at the intersection of, <clears throat> of molecular computing and biotechnologies and really focus on new technologies for reading and writing of, of molecular information. 
Um, and some broad areas that we've been working in recently is, uh, is molecular data storage and information processing. That is, once you have information stored in molecular form, how, how do you actually do some processing uh, of that data for things like uh, you retrieving, let's say, specific uh, data items or performing similarity searches or computations on that data. Um, as well as molecular recording systems. So not just storing digital information, but let's say coupling biosensors to, to storing their readouts in DNA, in DNA form, let's say within the DNA of a living organism, if you had a in vivo type of a biosensing uh, system. <clears throat> in addition to that, we developed new ways of sort of on the readout side, new molecular circuit readout reporters that are more multiplexable uh, than current methods, as well as new ways to read uh, natural biological molecules, things like proteins. So in single molecule protein sequencing is a big active area in my lab, as well as trying to sequence things uh, like sugars uh, for uh, glycomics uh, applications. And so a lot of these technologies ultimately interface, go from the molecular to digital realm using nanopore technology, uh, which has, which is another big area of my research, uh, dating back for over a decade now. And so you might be familiar with nanopores as DNA sequencing type devices. So uh, you might know Oxford Nanopore Technologies Minion device, which is actually a tech, uh, commercially available nanopore sensors array, nanopore sensor arrays that can sequence uh, single DNA molecules as well as RNA molecules and provide long reads in, in, real, in real time. And so one of the big, you know, sort of benefits of the sequencing technology, it's highly portable, uh, inexpensive, it can plug into your laptop, um, even eventually your smartphone. So a big thing in my group is sort of looking at new molecular applications outside just, you know, genomics or transcriptomics or even proteomics. Uh, and, you know, what are sort of these new molecular apps that we can de develop using this sort of an interface? And so, uh, you know, we have a number of recent publications in the different areas. Uh, you can check them out if you're interested. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is some unpublished work uh, about the Cas9 and Cas9 and how we're interfacing it for, for DNA-based data storage. Uh, so just a little brief inter, uh, uh, introduction for those who are not familiar with DNA, the concept of DNA data storage. So this little uh, faint smear at the bottom of this tube here uh, is enough DNA to store 10 terabytes of, of digital information. Okay, so this compare this to traditional sort of uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, information storage mediums like hard disk and flash flash drive. DNA is is orders of magnitude more dense. Um, it's orders of magnitude more stable. So so data can last in DNA form for hundreds, thousands, probably millions, millions of years, um, as well as when you, after you've stored it, it, it consumes very little energy. So it's a very highly, highly efficient storage medium in terms of storing a lot, a lot of information in a very small space and being able to keep that information around for a very long time. Okay, but some of the downsides right now is the technologies that we have to read and write that information uh, using DNA is, is orders of magnitude slower than, than traditional electronic, electronic systems. <clears throat> okay, so, so if you're looking at the read and write paths of, of DNA digital, uh, of storing information in, in DNA, you sort of, you know, starting on, starting on one side of your digital bits, you go through some encoding process. Uh, to map your bits into sequences of DNA, then you actually phys physically synthesize this DNA uh, using D you know, any sort of DNA synthesis technique, um, and then it can be stored in molecular form, and then to retrieve the, retrieve the information, you would use a DNA sequencing to then read the molecules, and then a decoder, which then translate those, translates those molecules back into the digital bits, okay? So we're sort of one aspect is really focused on technologies to add this interface of, of synthesis and sequencing and really sort of optimizing them in from the perspective of uh, biological or from the perspective of molecular computing, not from the perspective of, let's say, genomics, which is traditionally what, you know, uh, the sequencing and synthesis technologies have have been have been developed for. Um, so just sort of historically, I always like to sort of go back to to looking at exponential improvements that we've seen over the last few decades in DNA-based based data storage. All right, so, so the first actual experimental demonstration of, of DNA 
storing digital information in DNA was actually by artist uh, scientist Joe, Joe Davis back in 1988, where he stored 35 bits of, of uh, information that represented this ancient Germanic rune here. Um, actually experimentally did, la did that and, and stored that in DNA. And so this is, you know, very, very early on in sort of our ability to, uh, to synthesize uh, meaningful amounts of DNA. And as these technologies have improved, uh, both in synthesis and in sequencing, we've seen these order of magnitude jump in the amount of data that we've been able to encode. And that's what the y-axis is showing on a log scale. And so this this might this is a few years out of date now, but I still think this is the largest demonstration of, of large-scale information storage in in DNA, and this was over 200 megabytes of, of information stored in DNA that was demonstrated by <clears throat> collaboration by some of my colleagues here at the University of Washington, Washington as well as, as Microsoft. Um, and so not only storing storage of that amount of information, digital information um, in DNA, but also uh, they designed ways to perform random access such that you could select and ret selectively retrieve just subsets of, of files uh, using a PCR-based random access approach. Um, and let's see, also on here, it's sort of a, a different... What I mentioned earlier, sort of this concept of using biosensors or molecular recordings as also another form of, of DNA-based information storage, uh, but you're not storing, let's say, um, uh, you know, traditional digital content like images or text or videos. Um, you actually can, let's say, um, record the biological activity, let's say, of a cell or its environment and store that within the genome. And 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 we demonstrated this. Um, uh, during my postdoc, working with uh, with 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 Seth Shipman, a fellow postdoc um, in George Church's lab a few years ago, actually developing uh, sort of these in vivo type of DNA data storage um, um, systems. Okay, and we've we've continued some of that some of those that collaboration um, going forward. So another sort of really exciting uh, form of of DNA based data storage. And, and Jason Dury's lab has also done a lot of work using another CRISPR tool using Cas9 to, to do this, some of this uh, molecular recording in vivo as well. Um, so going back to what I'm going to be focusing on today within this DNA data storage workflow is really at this part here, where actually once we have digital information stored um, in DNA, how do we go about retrieving that more as, as efficiently as, as we can, because like I mentioned, uh, one of the downsides of DNA-based data storage compared to traditional electronic storage is that high latency and high cost. And so that really sort of lowers the lowers the overall impacts or applications that 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 these types of systems can have. So first I'll, I'll focus on how we're using Cas9 to perform random access. Um, and then the second part, I'll talk about how we're using Cas9 to actually perform content-based search um, within DNA data pool. <clears throat> so this is showing you here at the sort of the stack of how you might design an efficient uh, file retrieval system um, with uh, for DNA. So at sort of the lowest level, you can, you know, as you might imagine, you use basically phys physical addressing, you know, you have different uh, blocks of data stored in different different positions within a rack, right? And you can do that at, at down to some scale, uh, but then you sort of practically become limited um, uh, with, you know, physically what you can manipulate uh, at the macro scale. And then when you're looking at the advantages of DNA, you really want to have some sort of a chemical-based uh, addressing scheme or actually taking advantage of the unique features of the molecules. And so, as I mentioned before, looking sort of zooming zooming in now, at how we might specifically address individual DNA molecules, uh, this has traditionally been done using PCR. And so what you can do is essentially you can take your, your payloads, um, the, uh, the portions of your DNA strands are actually encoding the, DNA, uh, the, the information and then attach addresses uh, to them. So that's unique sequences of DNA, which, which essentially allows you to retrieve them out of a, out of a pool using PCR-based enrichment, right? So different, different, different file addresses will have different uh, primers that you would use to retrieve them. Okay, and this has been shown uh, to be pretty effective as we know PCR is, is a pretty uh, powerful technique, um, but some of the downsides to it are it's, it's time and energy consuming, right? You're using this, uh, 
um, you know, constant uh, temperature ramping up and down, um, relatively time consuming uh, compared to traditional computing. So we're talking on the order of tens of minutes, uh, even hours to, to do a PCR reaction. And that's relatively inflexible as far as the design considerations that you have for uh, being able to design specific addresses, right? So you really just have these thermodynamic parameters of, of primer annealing to your address site. And also uh, sort of the limited and multiplexing, that is your flexibility to say, give me not just one file, but give me these 10 files or these 20 files, right? So multiplexed PCRs is 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 pretty difficult um, because of the stochastic amplification bias, right? Can Even if you put in, you know, 20, 20 different primer pairs, you might end up amplifying all of them, but sort of the proportions that you retrieve is, is really stochastic. And what that uh, ends up doing is essentially um, that compounding bias leads to retrieval inefficiency. So you're actually trying to, so the reason you're doing the random access is so that when you, on the sequencing side, you can save resources and save time. Uh, but uh, PCR, the more you multiplex, the more that that sort of returns uh, start to diminish because of these these uh, significant biases and amplification uh, efficiencies across different primer primer pairs. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do is essentially, you know, can we do better with this? We want to make it faster, make it more ener energy efficient, and makes it more make it more flexible, right? So could we do things like multiplex random access, and could we also make it make it more more tunable, um, and also maybe perform other other operations compared to just uh, um, random access. So this is where we're turning to the Cas9 based strategy, where essentially I'm sure everyone is familiar. You have a Cas9's programmable nucle nuclease. You can program it to you know cut or bind any arbitrary DNA sequence using a guide RNA. And really, if you think about it, Cas9 has sort of evolved to do random access in a large in a large pool of DNA. So the way that we designed our, our DNA database architecture is, is, this is showing you one example strand design here. So we have the, the, the payload region in, in the middle, that's the actual portion of the, of the DNA strand that's encoding your, your digital data. And then, at, and then to that, we can append a unique file address uh, but in, instead of being a, a primer site, a primer binding site, it's actually a, a, a Cas9 target target sequence. Okay, and the way that this would look, essentially you can, what the workflow would look like here is you can take your digital file database, you do your encoding and synthesis, showing you the architecture that that, that I just uh, showed you there. Um, and then we go with a, to make this compatible with, with Cas9, as well as the nanopore based readout, we go through a few extra steps that I'm gonna show you here. And so we take this, you know, we can do large high throughput synthesis using something like a twist, uh, a, a twi twist array based synthesis. We make that double stranded, and then we also circularize each of these different uh, uh, strands here, and then we perform rolling circle amplification. So each of these circles now gets turned into a long double stranded catameric repeat, which I'll tell you why we do that in a second. And then we go through a dephosphorylation uh, step. And then we essentially store that molecule or store that pool is now, you know, can be can be put away for storage. Um, now, these extra steps um, compared to traditional PCR are uh, are extra extra steps that you're doing. Right. Um, but they're sort of you can cons consider these offline steps because this process only needs to be done once for the lifetime uh, of the data prior prior to its storage. Right. And so it still saves you a lot of time on the back end, which I'll, which I'll show you here. And this is how it would work. So uh, to actually then now perform random access within your stored pool, you would then take your guide addresses, mix them with Cas9, throw them into your hydrated uh, uh, DNA data storage pool. And I, I had mentioned that we, prior to storage, we dephosphorylate the, all the DNA strands, right? And so when we add Cas9, it only cuts the specific uh, file address locations. And what that does is it exposes um, five prime phosphates now at those cleavage sites, right? So now only the strands that were cut have five prime phosphates. And this is key because the next step in this protocol is then we go into, for nanopore sequencing, we actually go into the uh, adapter ligation step. And only the molecules which have phosphates because they were cleaved will actually end up being uh, appended with, with nanopore sequencing adapters, such that now we take that prepped library, we could throw it into a nanopore sequencer, <clears throat> and only the strands that we've uh, targeted with Cas9 will be sequenced, okay? So this is how we're specifically uh, uh, retrieving just, just the um, uh, addresses, address files that, that we want. 
Okay. <clears throat> Um, and the RCA step, what's one thing about is nice about this RCA step is because historically, not so much in recently, uh, but historically nanopore sequencing has, has been more error prone than, than other readout methods. And what the concatomeric sequencing of the uh, concatomer strands gives you is essentially uh, you can reduce your error rates by essentially taking every read has many repeats of that same sequence in it. And then you can do a concatomeric consensus alignment to reduce any of the random noise uh, between each of these reads to get a much higher accuracy consensus, which is a nice trick developed by um, the Vollmer lab out of, out of UC, UC Santa Cruz a few years back. Um, <clears throat> all right, so now here's actual results um, of this strategy. So we encoded a, a 20 megabytes of image data. It's split across 1.6 million total unique DNA strands. Um, and then uh, we uh, also then subdivided that into 25 different different files. And then each of these different files were given a different uh, Cas9 address. And then we asked, you know, how how well can we actually retrieve these specific files using Cas9? So we took the Cas9 with whatever guides we wanted to retrieve and throw threw those into the DNA pool. And it's just one minute or less um, that we incubated that um, that reaction before we went on to the sequencing sequencing step. So this is showing you uh, results here uh, from from. One of the first experiments we did, so this is a three file random access. So three-way multiplexing, we were trying to retrieve files two, 13, and, and 24. And that's shown on the x-axis. And then on the on the y-axis is enrichment score. Essentially, it's a normalized uh, number of sequencing reads that we retrieved for those specific file numbers. And that's in, in log scale. And so you can see we're retrieving orders of magnitude more reads from the specific files that we we're targeting using Cas9. Um, this is 12 file random access as well as then uh, a 20 file uh, random access here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we can see in every case, it's working pretty well, though even, you know, even up to 20 way multiplexing, we have a few, a few essentially retrieval errors, but, but on average, we're, we're getting, you know, one to two orders of magnitude enrichment for the Cas9 targeted files. So if we go back to sort of compare it to the PCR base, it's in, you know much faster, more energy efficient because it combines, it replaces you know uh, cycling temperature cycling with the isothermal step, and it's also has minimal sort of mix and wash steps, which we think is really important for you know the future of, of automating these types of these types of uh, uh, data storage workflows. And also an interesting thing is that that we found it's also a, a kinetically kinetically tunable. So what do, what do I need, mean about this? So this is our traditional, this is this is showing you results from a single file uh, search. So we're just trying to pull out file 10. And this is with a one minute incubation uh, with Cas9 with the data pool. So it's doing a really nice job of just retrieving file 10. <clears throat> and then if we go incubate it longer, let's say for 30 minutes, we notice we also start to now retrieve additional files outside of file 10. So if we look at this file 13, one thing that you might notice, we're also retrieving it in um, in excess even of file, of file 10. So this file 13, if you look at the address, it only has a two nucleotide edit distance uh, uh, difference um, to the file address that we are trying to, to retrieve. And so Typically in, in a Cas9 applications, let's say for genome editing, this, this sort of is off target, right? The Cas9 will cut sequences that are similar to, to the guide sequence, uh, to the specific guide sequence that you programmed it with. It's sort of a biological bug, right? People really want to limit these off target effects, right? But for our applications, we wondered if we actually turn this biological bug um, into a technological feature. <clears throat> okay, and so you imagine what what you might use this for is something like content-based similarity search, where you actually can take a query, you have a, a DNA da a, a database encoded in DNA, right? And this database could be massively large. You don't even know what's what's in the database. Just like you you might search the internet, you don't know everything that exists in the internet. So you you might uh, do you do a search. And so that search might be something like a, you know, Im image similarity search was what we're showing here. So you can take it, take a query file or a query image. Uh, you search it within the within the database and you say, are there any, uh, if you're doing similarity search, are there any pictures, let's say similar to, to my query picture? And ideally what you'd pull out is now a bunch of data files that were similar to, to, to what you sent into there. <clears throat> Okay, and so this this concept is known as semantic hash, hashing, right? Where semantically similar documents will have uh, will be similar in address space, and the way that you can do this 
uh, is essentially what you need to do this is, is have some ability to learn a hash function, right? That can map similar inputs to similar addresses while mapping dissimilar inputs to, to dissimilar addresses. And we wondered, you know, can this be done in, in a DNA-based database? And so there was some uh, preliminary work uh, published uh, a couple of years ago now where they actually showed this was possible just using simple DNA, DNA hybridization. So what they use is actually a deep learning based network that could take uh, similar that encoded similar um, uh, documents to have similar DNA sequence to be represented or addressed with similar DNA sequences and dissimilar ones with 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 dissimilar DNA sequences such that you could take a you could search that database using a DNA strand that would then physically hybridize with very, very similar DNA or, or data items within that database to retrieve them and for actually perform this image similarity search. And really amazing results is actually they showed that this DNA-based approach, the efficiency of that approach actually um, at massive scale uh, uh, approaches the efficiency of the state-of-the-art state um, electronic algorithms. <clears throat> Okay, but one of the big downsides of this is looking at some, from an efficiency standpoint, it's incredibly slow, right? So this needs to be done in thermodynamic equilibrium. So there's a 24 hour annealing step. Uh, so really high latency and really high um, energy uh, uh, consumption. <clears throat> and so our Cas9 based, Cas9 based approach, we said, okay, we're much more efficient. So can we do a sort of similar content based search approach using Cas9? And so this is where the deep learning uh, uh, um, is is called for here, where essentially we're using um, a a neural network based hash, a neural network to essentially learn the hash function to encode uh, images that are similar to a query image image to uh, with with addresses um, that have a very high probability of being cleaved by that by the search image, right? And so I won't go into all the details here, but this is sort of the architecture uh, and the training process um, um, that we used to do that, where the key key things here, are essentially the first, the inputs with every forward pass into this network is, is we're learning a, a vector-based representation of the image features. And these this gets, and we just borrowed this from the VGG16, which is a popular uh, image uh, classification uh, neural network. We're using one of the final output layers there, which essentially is a representation of image features um, in a in a vector-based representation, and that's used as input to to the to the part of the neural network that we're actually trying to train, that essentially maps those image features into DNA sequences or Cas9 target or guide sequences. Okay, and then key to sort of this training loop, the way that we actually you know generate the loss. Uh, so to update the weights of our DNA sequence encoder is using a Cas9 cleavage predictor, uh, specifically this one from the from the Finkelstein lab. <clears throat> okay, and so we uh, train this uh, model on on millions of different images, and then we simulated it, simulated it on this pool of 1.6 encoded uh, 1.6 million images that we encoded using this using this trained neural network. And at the top, and that is is showing the results from an untrained model uh, using and trying to search for this image of this cat within this 1.6 million images. Essentially, you don't retrieve, you don't retrieve anything because all the images are just sort of random, randomly addressed with different uh, Cas9 target sites. And Cas9 is, 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 is very, very specific, right? So we really don't cut anything within that pool. And then the trained model results actually here showing you here on the on the x-axis, the lower the number means the more similar our retrieved image was to our query cat image, and on the the y-axis is showing you our simulated yield or essentially number of sequencing reads that we would get uh, for images that fall within that bin. So what this is showing you is that we are essentially learning to retrieve the most similar images um, to our to our query. Okay, and these are more simulation results for for different different images, um, and then so the workflow. <clears throat> To actually do this now is essentially you can take your image database, you put it through that encoder, that hash function that assigns assigns these Cas9 addresses uh, to the different image files, and then to actually perform a search. You take a query image, you also put it through that encoder, puts it in, turns it into a Cas9 guide sequence, and then you can physically incubate it with the with the DNA data pool, and then perform your nanopore sequencing to actually then recover your your uh, matching matching data items, right? 
And so essentially per performing that file uh, <clears throat> uh, content-based search. And with the kinetic tunability, right, it's a little bit more flexible than PCR. The more, lo the long you can imagine, the longer you wait, the more time, uh, the, the more likely Cas9 is to cut off-target off target sequences, uh, right, and essentially give you, you know, uh, more similar results in the beginning, and then less you start generating more and more uh, results that are less similar as as you as the incubation uh, uh, goes on. All right, so now results uh, from this and preliminary results from these experiments. So what we wanted to do is actually, okay, how well does this work? So we took did it on a smaller scale. We took four hundred uh, images instead of one point six million. We just took four hundred, encoded them, put them, pass them through our uh, encoder encoded them uh, into uh, uh, Cas9 uh, target sites along with their payloads. Um, and then to the, the search that we actually did is we took an image of, of Bigfoot, right? So I, I come from the Pacific North Northwest, so I'm always uh, a fond believer that Bigfoot is out there somewhere. So we wanted to say, is Bigfoot within, within this database? So we searched to find out if there's any similar images of Bigfoot within this database, okay? So we took that image, we encoded it into a guide RNA. We put it with these database of 400 images. I didn't know what, uh, we just randomly selected a subset of these images. So we weren't sure what was actually in there. And these are these are the sequencing results that we actually uh, uh, retreat um, um, uh, found here. And so this is split up into different bins along the X axis. We're on the very rightmost. Essentially, uh, those are all the uh, sequences that were most enriched. Okay, and then on the y-axis is essentially the similarity score of, of the different images, where uh, the uppermost is the lower the score uh, is at the top, and that means you're most similar to our to our Bigfoot image, and then at the and and then as you go down, it, you're more dissimilar, um, and that's uh, judged by the Euclidean distance of the image feature vectors. Okay, so what essentially what we have is in our most enriched bin. Okay, everything up at the top right means it was the most enriched um, during in our sequencing results, and it also was the most similar matching to our to our Bigfoot uh, image. So that's nice. And also similarly, we are filtering out sort of the most dissimilar sequences. So really achieving um, what the effect that we would like. <clears throat> so it worked worked pretty well. And this is with a, just a one minute incubation incubation or search time within that database. So then the question here is, did we find Bigfoot? So if we look at what are some of the highest matching images that we were able to retrieve out uh, of our pool, one of them what we found is, was this picture. So it wasn't Bigfoot, uh, it was just a bear. Um, so the uh, the search continues, but but we are still, we are still pleased with, with this result. Okay, and with that, I'll stop there and happy to uh, take take any questions. And uh, thanks everyone for your attention. <clears throat> any questions? <clears throat> so, it's very interesting. So you mentioned that this one minute is uh, kind of optimum time to do this search, and then increasing the time you see kind of non-specific lead or finding. How about? The, the minimum time, have you tried like 10 seconds, 20 seconds? What are the necessary time to have this search result? Have you tried yeah. that? Yeah, great, great point. We actually just recently, uh, essentially zero time, one second. As soon as we uh, put the cast nine in and then we stop the reaction, we can still retrieve results even in, in even in that time frame. So these these sides are a little bit outdated, just showing us the one time, but we've done it, you know, less than five seconds and cast nine is so efficient. Uh, it can cleave. It can cleave quite a bit, um, even in that short time frame. Thank you. One more questions. The, um, the similarity metric must be established before you do the encoding, and once you encode it, you're pretty much stuck with that metric. Um, and these, as you were saying, these libraries could last hundreds, millions of years. So you're you're pretty much stuck with that. So do you do you imagine that facilities would be using multiple different similarity metrics or images, it's easy to, to identify similarity, but there's lots of other types of data where the, the similarity metric might not be known. So how, how do you think about those types of things? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, you know, depending on what the domain is, so images, it's it could be pretty, pretty universal, you might imagine for text as well. Um, and then, yeah, as you sort of combine databases that that might have multi modes of different types of, of data, you might imagine 
some sort of a hierarchical scheme where you might have some things that are fit are are you know contain hard hard addresses um and you know you might have a, a mixed modal database and maybe you use pcr to retrieve just the images or just text files and then you perform a search like this uh content-based search right so you can imagine sort of a hierarchy there is, is one way we can think about it great thank you jeff uh just right before lunch so we can close uh this session thank you for all speakers how i hand it to lunch arrived yeah I'll, I'll set it up i just didn't want to make more noise okay so lunch will be ready soon um and then just, just a reminder that we have the the poster session also happening so it'll be lunch and the poster session session and we get back started with talks at one o'clock thank you well, uh so um Normally, this would be uh, an opportunity for the director of the uh, AVPDU to be speaking with you, and, and uh, she sends her regrets for not being able to attend. Uh, she uh, came down with a little uh, illness, having come back from Germany at another conference. Uh, so, so you're stuck with me today. So, <laughs> uh, James, are you okay if we record? Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, I'm James Gardner. I'm a program manager for the Advanced Biofuels and Bioproducts Process De uh, Development Unit. And we are on the third floor of this building. This is a 15,000 uh, square foot uh, uh, pilot plant facility that is involved in a variety of different kinds of bioprocess uh, development activities, uh, not the least of which are the activities that we are involved in uh, in collaboration with the Agile Biofuels. I'll get into that. So uh, today's discussion will step through the ABPDU, provide you a little bit of context and the kind of work that we do, and then uh, drill down a little bit into the work that we've done with the Agile Bio Foundry, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with the uh, introduction to the team, acknowledging our work. So uh, the ABPDU is uh, a facility that, it, that consists of a variety of different kinds of bioreactor capabilities. And here you're peering into the fermentation suite, uh, and I'll, I'll get into the, the specifics of that. Uh, the team is about 25 or 30 people strong, depending upon uh, when, when you ask and, and uh, who you're referencing. Uh, and you can see uh, the, the, the kind of work that they were doing in this, in this image here. The ABPDU was established uh, in the 2008-2009 uh, 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 timeframe during the uh, Recovery Act years when the uh, kind of global economic meltdown was taking place and groups were looking for ways to boost the economy. Uh, we saw an opportunity and so we developed the ABPDU as a way of understanding the scalability of different types of fuel technologies that were arising from synthetic biology, especially the bioenergy research centers such as JBay. Uh, in in uh, the 13 years that it has been in existence, uh, like much of the uh, uh, community's efforts, uh, we have turned to uh, helping a variety of groups on a whole variety of different kinds of bioproduct uh, pursuits. And, and so that, it, that continues to include fuels, but it also involves uh, foods and uh, uh, different kinds of uh, chemistries and different, uh, including different types of cell-free uh, modalities. Uh, so, so lots of different kinds of work. Again, I'll get into some of those specifics and, uh, and so uh, at the end of the day, we've been helping uh, groups uh, for, for this past uh, 12 or 13 years, and that has included uh, a variety of, of companies that are kind of household names, as they say. You, you, you can see the Shell logo there as, as just one, for instance. We've worked with, um, with uh, different uh, global arms of Procter & Gamble, uh, we've worked with a whole host of different uh, uh, small companies that you've probably never heard of across the uh, materials and chemicals, food, health, and ag space, and in doing so have helped to uh, really establish uh, all these groups in terms of their uh, understanding of how to move forward in, in, uh, in, in commercializing their product. 
in addition to working with companies, uh, we also work with a variety of academic groups and, uh, and government organizations, and that has helped to uh, understand how to uh, uh, work with uh, different uh, intellectual property and, and how that is licensed uh, from, from uh, non-practicing entities such as uh, universities and so on. Uh, and so uh, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the fundamental understanding that what happens at the, at the multi-well scale is all well and good and very important in terms of understanding the early stages of, of a technology. But that has often very little to do uh, with how things will behave in a bioreactor, where uh, what was essentially uh, something that, that behaves like water can rapidly become uh, uh, far thicker and more viscous and uh, where uh, both uh, uh, heat transfer and uh, mass transfer become uh, an issue. So, so that is, is the realm in which we operate and understand uh, the processes that we work with. We, uh, uh, we kind of go across like six orders of magnitude in terms of the work that we do. We, we uh, do dwell in uh, the micro well plate uh, range so that we can understand how those uh, technologies advance into the uh, microliter, milliliter, and up to the liter scale. We have two 300 liter fermenters and then a whole variety of uh, different um, uh, bioreactors at the, at the lesser scale that allow us to understand how, how those uh, technologies will, will uh, move up that scale to the 10,000, 50,000 meter scale. Uh, at the center of the uh, slide here, you'll see this, uh, this, this uh, setup here, which is uh, an Amber 250 reactor. And this is a pretty remarkable uh, piece of equipment in that it is an array of 12 bioreactors and uh, controlled by a computer and a robotic arm. This allows us to perform things like uh, design of experiments type uh, arrangements where we can understand an optimization space rather than uh, simply looking at a one factor at a time type of an arrangement. This gives us a, a great deal of power in terms of media optimization uh, and different kinds of feed strategies and so on. Um, in addition to fermentation, we have a, a variety of chemistries that we are capable of executing in uh, special uh, types of uh, reactors and, and uh, tube reactors. And you can see the different uh, volumes that we're capable of achieving uh, down to the one milliliter uh, level up to the 200 liter level. And that uh, crosses both uh, liquid water as well as uh, steam uh, types of temperature regimes uh, and across a variety of, of uh, pressure scales. In terms of uh, how to actually commercialize uh, a technology, at the end of the day, a, a large driver of that cost is the uh, act of purifying that material from a bioreactor. And so we have a wide variety of downstream uh, unit operations that are important for understanding the scalability of a technology. Uh, and that includes a variety of solid liquid separations, cell disruption capabilities, extraction, purification, and evaporation and drying. So that is, uh, is all too often an, uh, kind of an unforeseen uh, cost add when it comes to the, uh, under, uh, when it comes to the development of the technology. And so we try to bring as many different kinds of of uh, tools and techniques to, uh, to bear to uh, various problems that we help solve. In addition to that, uh, we have a variety of analytical capabilities in terms of separation sciences, as well as um, various uh, uh, modalities of uh, enzyme activity readings and, uh, and other types of uh, techniques. Uh, beyond that, we can leverage uh, uh, the capabilities of the national lab system itself. That includes uh, the advanced light source for things like X-ray diffraction, as well as the molecular foundry, which we have uh, worked with uh, in a, on a variety of projects for, say, transmission electron microscopy, uh, as well as other techniques. Um, we generally have about a 12-week uh, horizon when it comes to collaborating with uh, industry. 
but we will work with groups in order to, uh, to collapse that timeline if it's necessary. This is one example where we worked with a company that has a new technology for the production of indigo dye, and they are uh, interested in, in commercializing that. They were, uh, this is a story of, of a company that was, uh, was on the verge of, of obtaining new funds, and they really, really needed this, uh, this uh, project to be executed on a short timeline. So we worked with them to collapse that timeline so that we could uh, uh, drive forward on the project, get their material produced in our uh, own reactors, isolate it, and then hand it to them so that they could uh, use that dye to, uh, to uh, uh, apply it to a spool of yarn, which then they were able to use in their, in their pitch to, uh, to investors. And so it's, it's really just a, a way of, of exemplifying the fact that at, at the labs and particularly at ABPDU, we are very sensitive to the needs of our collaborators. And, and it's as much as anything, a, uh, a recommendation for how to uh, understand the, uh, the kind of pressures that small companies can be under in terms of their own survival. And so, uh, and so at, at the end of the day, we are uh, kind of their their go-to for helping to evaluate the scalability of their materials. And if we can help them succeed, then we succeed. In, in, uh, in uh, uh, some, we've helped uh, several companies commercialize, I think a total of 17 different pro products over the uh, course of our dozen or so years of existence. And, uh, and that has been a real point of pride for our, uh, for our facility in having uh, uh, hand in, in all of these different products uh, come to market. Uh, and then uh, I, I'll just point out that on the website, we have a number of case studies that are available. So uh, you can go to abpdu.lbl.gov and uh, check out our, our Getting a little bit into the Agile Biofoundry work, I'll start with uh, some, some sort of basic uh, science and engineering research that, uh, that we uh, were involved in, in terms of understanding uh, different processes and different, uh, different product uh, uh, outputs. Uh, in this instance, we were working with a, uh, with a technology that we had developed in-house, and we were, un we were curious in, uh, to understand how those uh, technologies would scale at different facilities. And so we worked with the integrated biorefinery in Golden, Colorado at the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, and uh, shared uh, those, those technologies uh, across the two facilities and looked to see how well they would perform. And uh, much to our surprise, they did not perform the same whatsoever. There was uh, quite a difference in terms of both the tighter as well as the productivity of, of the uh, the technology. After sharing all of the different things that we could think of to share, uh, down to the water and the micronutrients and so on, we, uh, we discovered that it was the elevation that was driving the change. It was, a, it was simply a matter of the subtle differences in dissolved oxygen in the, in the bioreactors at 2,000 meters versus essentially sea level uh, here at the, in, in San Francisco Bay. So, uh, so this is a really important kind of uh, cautionary tale of understanding in a very precise way uh, uh, how, why, where, and when uh, a technology is executed. Beyond that, we are also pioneering some interesting technologies for uh, online uh, evaluation of, of uh, cell health over the course of a fermentation using uh, different sorts of, of uh, imaging techniques that we are hoping to, uh, to really uh, sort of change the narrative on, on uh, understanding uh, kind of uh, cell health at the cellular level in uh, a bioreactor. And so this is just the beginning of this research that, that we've uh, kind of helped launch. We were excited to see where it goes. Uh, and this has been part of our work in conjunction with the Agile Biofoundry. 
in fact, we've worked with a number of companies that are uh, external collaborators of the Agile Bio Foundry and have contributed to their success. And that has included uh, some of the groups that you're seeing here. Uh, I think it's a total of seven or eight different projects that are running uh, either uh, that are either recently concluded or are currently running or are still in the process of being contracted. One of those is with Enduro Genetics, uh, which has developed an interesting product addiction uh, technology that they are working to port into different uh, non-canonical posts uh, for industrial use. And so we have been working with that team to uh, in, evaluate the scalability and the translatability of their technology across hosts. In addition to that, we are working with uh, different universities who have also been awardees of, of uh, directed funding opportunities for the uh, Agile Bio Foundry. And in this instance, we are working with uh, uh, Washington University in St. Louis and the University of Delaware for their technology in um, uh, chemostat type uh, continuous fermentation system. One of the real interesting emergent uh, capabilities that we have uh, put online is a, uh, is a gas fermentation capability that has been utilized by iMicrobes among uh, several other groups. So this company, Industrial Microbes, has evaluated and developed ways of uh, engineering E. coli for the use of different kinds of gas feedstocks. So gas fermentation, of course, is a, a, a very hot and emergent uh, area of research right now. Unfortunately, it's difficult to do. Uh, gas fermentation is uh, requires a very careful uh, uh, kind of safety envelope uh, established, uh, working with a variety of both uh, toxic as well as uh, explosive gases means that, uh, that there has to be very careful uh, considerations for, for safety. Uh, so, so uh, in working with the Agile Bio Foundry, we have been able to kind of open the door for, uh, for different uh, groups that would otherwise not have the wherewithal to, uh, to really utilize or, or, or uh, develop their technologies in the context of gas fermentation. And so that has been a, a really interesting emergent uh, area of capability for the APPDU and the Agile Bio Foundry. I'll uh, just add parenthetically that in addition to gas fermentation, uh, that is the use of gas feedstocks, uh, gas fermenters are really valuable in understanding how a technology will behave at the higher hydrostatic pressures that are expected at large uh, volumes of bioreactors. So we have utilized uh, this technology, this, uh, this, this uh, gas fermentation equipment uh, to evaluate, say, how a, how a technology would behave at, uh, at the 50,000 liter scale, simply by adding pressure to the vessels. And so this has been an incredibly valuable uh, uh, point of development for groups like CheckerSpot in their bio relationship. Okay, so um, all in all, uh, there's been about a $50 million uh, investment uh, in terms of uh, the, the public dollars that have supported the ABPDU programs. Uh, that has in turn resulted in something uh, in shouting distance of $2 billion of, of uh, funds that those companies have gone out and raised as a function of the data that they have developed and generated through their collaboration with the ABPDU. So a 40 fold uh, return on investment of public sector dollars is, uh, is, is rare, uh, shall we say. And so this has been a very, very valuable investment uh, for, for the public sector uh, in terms of helping to uh, kind of stabilize and, and, and uh, give rise to, uh, to the uh, biomanufacturing uh, sector in the United States. In addition to that, uh, we are constantly uh, sort of uh, competing with our own collaborators for our talent as we have come to discover and they're uh, uh, they're not hesitant to uh, uh, to poach our, our people uh, who, who we train up and then run their projects and then they decide that when they finally do have that uh, that great uh, investment money then they uh, are all too happy to 
uh, to pay our our, uh, our researchers a little bit more than we can, and uh, which is fine. This is a, a good problem to have. It means that the uh, local economy, as well as the international community, is uh, succeeding if we can help to contribute to the workforce. And so we've embraced that uh, and really uh, celebrate the fact that we have over 100 alumni in the 13 years of our existence and, and in doing so have contributed greatly to, uh, to the workforce and the talent that's out there. And so I'll leave you with uh, just a, a quick overview and an acknowledgement of the hardworking team. I, I spend my time mostly writing a desk, so I don't really actually ever get to touch product. And, uh, and uh, as, as uh, lean production folks would tell you, if you're not touching product, then you're basically waste in the system. And so, uh, and so I, I try to just uh, keep my head down and, and, and uh, hope that I can contribute somehow to the team that, that works hard to make it all happen. So thank you and let me know if you have any questions. We've seen uh, last summer. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, particular um, operation system between the entire biofound and your APPT? Are there, are there any particular collaborations? Yes. Uh, yes, there are, definitely. And uh, uh, we are working with, uh, I think at, at the moment, we have at least four active projects that are uh, ongoing. Uh, that can involve uh, on sort of one end of the spectrum, uh, kind of data analysis and understanding how to, you know, kind of build a more robust uh, data pipeline. You know, at the end of the day, everything we do nowadays, whether it's your refrigerator at home, your car, or your bioreactor, it's all basically a computer. And so we are very interested in understanding how to, uh, how to really make that data stream more robust. And so we're working with groups to make that happen. That's sort of at one end of the scale. Uh, and then at the other end of the scale is the more kind of classical bioprocess engineering where we're working with groups to understand yeah, exactly how scalable a technology might be. How does it perform at a 300 liter scale, say? Or what is the downstream processing methodology that we can recommend to collaborate? A biofoundry type project. So, so definitely it runs the gamut. So you're helping out many groups in academia and industry. So on what basis do you prioritize your projects? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And it's very multifaceted. So uh, so they can come in a variety of flavors. Uh, if it's a funds in type of relationship, meaning that they are essentially coming with their own privately raised funds. Uh, then uh, what we will typically do is try to really uh, narrow down exactly what it is they need in terms of intellectual property development. If, if it's something where they can strictly come in with their own intellectual property, and we don't need to concern ourselves with the possibility of new IP development, then we can go down a much more rapid path. Uh, and so in those instances, is, is essentially as long as they are... Um, a paying collaborator, the, the, the breadth of capability and, and the options that they have are really theirs to be able to identify and define. Uh, you know, if it's, if they're asking for something that is, you know, kind of goes beyond our safety envelope, then that's, that can't be done. Uh, but generally speaking, if they are coming in with their own funds, then, then it's a much broader set of criteria. Uh, it has to still meet the kind of needs and the, and the uh, pursuits of the bioenergy technology office in terms of our overall uh, kind of uh, mission space, as they say. But generally speaking, it's pretty broad. Now, if we are working with a group that has received uh, funding from the Department of Energy or uh, is working with the Agile Biofoundry more specifically, then that process of, of identifying kind of their eligibility is much more rigorous. And so that goes through you know, the, the entire competitive uh, application process before we have ever seen it. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot for your introduction.